Tonight's council meeting of Tuesday, July the 11th, the way we start off our council meetings is with the singing of O Canada. So tonight we've got special, a special guest here to sing, two women, young women, Milana and Ivana, Masia's sisters. So ladies, if maybe you want to come around, come, oh yeah, right up to the microphone. And before, I'm going to read a little bit about you, don't stare yet, you've got to make sure the little red light is on the little buttons. Can you see over there, Councillor Campbell, if they're on? Yes. Okay, great. So let me read a little about, about you ladies before you start, okay? Today, we have the Masia sisters. Both girls attend St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Elementary School, where Milana will enter grade seven, and Ivana will be in grade four in September. The Masia sisters have been performing together for four years, enjoy singing lessons, piano lessons, violin, and competitive dance. Ivana was the recent recipient of a Kiwanis scholarship for violin. Milana is currently part of an all new Toronto girl band called Girl Power. The band's goal is to empower youth through music and dance. The Masia sisters are delighted to sing our national anthem tonight. So ladies, whenever you're ready. Oh Canada. Our home and native land To patriot love In our last son's command With glory hearts we see thee rise The true north strong and free From far and wide, O Canada we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. On behalf of City Council and all the residents, we want to say thank you. That was one of the nicest harmonizing O Canada's that I've heard here before. So congratulations and thank you very much and have a great summer, ladies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if you want to be seated, um, the next uh, order of business, I'm going to ask our commissioner, Dave Smith, to come to the microphone. And from time to time, Dave writes poetry and he enlightens situations with the way he writes. So when he's here tape protecting the public and doing what he does for us in the city, in his spare time, this is what he's working on. So without further ado, we offer our commissioner, Dave Smith, the opportunity to read his latest bit of poetry. Canada Day. It's 150 years of Canada. 150 years as Canada is set through Upper and Lower Canada, an infrastructure that we get, the mighty thunder, the pounding roar of the Niagara River on the rocks and shore. The Niagara Escarpment is quite the shelf. It's given Canada a lot of wealth. The beauty, the splendor, the eternal roar has attracted citizens to our fine shore. 150 years from sea to sea, it captured hearts and liberty. The railroad tied its mighty knot. The Rocky Mountains, what we got. The breadbasket of the prairies, too, kept nations fed during World War II. From the Union Jack to our Canadian flag, rich in history, our constitution with pride. It's our freedom from sea to sea a massive country that includes both you and me. Look at Canada, a place to call home. What a nation to live in Rome. 150 years as we continue to thrive. Our strength is people. Our nation comes alive. All right. well done, well done. Dave, 
you know, and I appreciate and also Stephen here for bringing your talent to us at the city and letting us know some of the great things that you've written. And he's written great stories, and great poems on a number of different topics. And it's great from time to time that he offers his time to share with us. It's a real talent that you've got. And thanks for sharing that with all the residents of Niagara Falls. Well done. Thank you very much, Dave. He's a commissioner with the city. Of <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Councilor Cario said he'd be okay getting a parking ticket now. That's great. All right. Uh, first order of business is the adoption of the minutes from our June 13th and June, June 22nd meetings. Councilor Morocco, seconded by Councilor Strange. Uh, you have an item for uh, council? Yep, Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. I had uh, contacted the clerk. Um, to make him aware and suggested that it need to be done in open council. Just one small error in the minutes, and it's on the very first page. Disclosure of people. Which minutes, Councillor? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the June the 13th. 13th, yep. And it's under uh, uh, disclosure of uh, pecuniary interest. It says, Councillor Crater indicated uh, pecuniary interest with check number 405, 4050 made payable to himself. Mm -hmm. That wasn't correct, it's payable to the Niagara District Catholic School Board. And the reason was it wasn't payable to a member of my family is because a member of my family works for the Niagara District School Board. So I just wanted to have that correct. Okay, you've got that, uh, Mr. Clerk? Thank okay, you. thank you for that. Uh, if there's no further changes, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Uh, now we move on to deputations and Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Disclosures of a pecuniar interest, please. Councilor Inoni and Morocco. Check 405707 made out to myself. Thank you. Councilor Morocco. Yes, check number uh, 405509 made to my spouse. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo and Cario. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, Nega Catholic District School Board is my employer. They get sent, uh, I guess, uh, their levy, which is 0008800. Zero seven, and also OPA 118, PBD 2017-26. My family recently purchased land in the area. Okay, noted. Councilor Cario. Thank you, Worship. A little bit of an odd one, but under the communications and comments of the city clerk, the um, Victoria Center, well, all the BIAs are asking for funding, but I'm a member of the Victoria Center BIA and the Fallsview BIA. I'm going to declare a conflict as I've just recently been made aware after talking to Mr. Todd, that if someone doesn't, if one person or some people in the BIAs don't pay their taxes or are dragging their taxes, the city puts the money in to cover their share of the funding that goes into the BIA. So in that case, it would be city money that could go into our BIA, so I'm gonna declare a conflict of interest. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Crater? Uh, yes. Uh, under municipal accounts, check number 405442. Um, that check is payable to myself. And under municipal accounts, um, <coughs> check 0088 and 0007. Uh, that's payable to the Niagara District Catholic School Board. A member of my family works for the school board. And finally, under the consent uh, agenda, uh, report CD 2017 03. I have a conflict with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. If there's no other disclosures, then I've, I've got check number 404866, check made out to myself. So moving along, uh, we're gonna start off with deputations and presentations. In my first presentation, I'd like to bring up Ethan Zahn. Ethan, you wanna come on up here? Just come around there, there's an opening in the gate. Zahn, I get that, sir. Zahn, get that right. Yeah, right through there. Come on up here, Ethan. How are you? Nice to meet you. Very good. Come on over here. So, did you see it, Zahn? Is that the right? Yes, Zahn. Zahn, okay. So, let me read a little bit about Ethan, uh, Ethan Zahn. And, uh, you know, maybe I should have Linda up here, too. Yeah, why don't you come on up here, Linda? Come on up here and join me. This is a neat story, and some of you might have seen it in today's paper. And um, uh, when the paper saw that we were recognizing Ethan today, uh, they decided to write a story about him over the weekend. So it was in today's uh, Niagara Falls Review paper. Oh, right. Yeah. 
So let me read a little bit about Ethan. This is an act of bravery, and a, a good young man, come over here a little closer, Ethan, I won't bite. Okay. Today we're gonna re recognize him. He's 12 years old, you're a big boy, and he did the right thing, and he showed bravery beyond his years. Ethan was walking home from school, and he goes to St. Vincent de Paul, so the same as you girls there, St. Vincent de Paul, and he was walking home with some other students, and he spotted a woman, this would be Linda Villad. She was sitting on her front steps, and the steps were covered in blood. So, you know, a lot of kids, typical kids, would have just looked and looked back at their cell phone and maybe kept walking and not really paid a lot of attention. But we've got a special boy here. So he commits his mother, his mother's here, hello, wait. Hello. <laughs> convinces his mother to go back with him to Linda's home where they check up on her because she had said she was okay. So earlier in the day, Vlad had fallen at work and suffered a head injury. At work, she continued to feel unwell and she came home. Once she was home, she blacked out and fell backward down the concrete stairs. After nearly a month in the hospital, Linda was eventually released and searched out Ethan's family in order to thank him. Because Ethan, that wasn't good enough. He went back and they checked on her. And, and if they hadn't found her, you know, it could have ended in a real sad way. But because of what he did, it ended, it's got a happy ending. And the nice thing is it's a great example for other kids. It's an example for other people that you take ownership of your situation. You're not, there's no such thing as innocent bystanders. We're all bystanders and we all have to be engaged and we all have to do our part. And Ethan, what a great example for a 12 year old boy. So Ethan, it's not only Linda who's grateful, but it's your family who's proud of you and it's your whole community. And I, I'm here with all the city council, all the residents at home that are watching on TV, probably about three or four of them. And, uh, no, actually, the funny thing is, surprisingly, I don't know why, but a lot of people watch this show. Like, it's one of the highest rated shows. So we want to thank you for your act of bravery and for doing the right thing and going with your instinct, right? They say your gut, his gut was telling him something, and he listened to his gut. He didn't ignore it. And on behalf of the city council, all of us members, we want to thank you, and on behalf of all the residents, for doing the right thing. So what I'd like to do, present you with two things, Ethan. First, this is a um, uh, certificate. That's not totally flattened out here, but a certificate uh, that I've signed uh, on behalf of the city, just to remind you how proud we are of you and your act of bravery. I'd like to give that to you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, this is a City of Niagara Falls backpack. Very cool backpack. And, uh, <laughs> and it's got like a water bottle with uh, the crest. Yeah, it's got the city crest. I don't know if there's anything else in the bags. I'm not sure what the girls put in there. First aid kit. What's that? First aid kit? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the Rubik's Cube kind of thing. That's the City of Niagara Falls thing. And I think a little bit of, I'm not sure if there's anything. To be honest, I'm not sure what the girls put in there. Oh my God. He's got a bobblehead in there. Look at that guy. Oh, <laughs> <She's very involved. laughs> oh wow. You poor kid. I'm so sorry. What I mean. <laughs> Yeah, you know what, we're, we're going to line you up with a couple more things. Yeah, Councilor Morocco, you're absolutely right. We're going to line you up also with some attraction passes for some of the neat attractions in the city. So maybe before you leave, we'll get your phone number. What's that? Yeah, oh, sure. Well, I think that's a great idea. Anything else? Want to throw in a card? Just giving everything away. Mr. Mary, don't use a Yes, please. Standing ovation, but I think this is... Uh, absolutely. Let's give him a standing ovation. Awesome. awesome. Linda, come on in. We'll get a picture first. And now, why don't we ask, uh, Ethan, would you like to say maybe a couple words to the people here? Anything you want to? Um, just thank you for everything and putting me in the newspaper and thank you for the bag and for the certificate and thank you for helping me out with the situation. And I hope you feel better. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's a good boy. I think Bell's Bell's got it. You got it. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Rashka. Good boy. Thank you. Thank you. Very proud of him. Very proud. He's sweet. He's adorable. He's adorable. 
We all hope our boys grow up to be like Ethan. Now I feel bad, uh, Mr. Ludzik. I don't know how you're going to top that one. <laughs> but uh, we've got Steve Ludzik, hockey legend and fundraising legend in the house. So he's going to address us about his annual celebrity row scheduled for August the 19th at the Scotiabank Convention Center. So Steve, come on up to the microphone. There, hey. Wayne, how are you? It's our old strength and conditioning coach, Niagara Falls, 1978. I'm still sore. <laughs> um, thanks for having me here, guys. Uh, I just, uh, 18 years ago, I got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I kept quiet about it until six years ago. And I decided that I was going to do something about it. And uh, we've been very fortunate that we've uh, run a therapeutic uh, course for people with Parkinson's disease. We've had great success. Uh, uh, we are number one in Canada, made number one in Canada. I can say that safely because nobody else does what we do in Canada. <laughs> um, we look after Parkinson's patients and help them get back on their feet, and we've had great success. I wanted to, we have a golf tournament. It's sold out, so it's in two days. But the roast, all, all our funding is done through a roast. That's where we make all money. It doesn't cost the patients a cent to come to my Parkinson's clinic, not a penny. But we raise all the money through table sales, at, and uh, we're roasting Dino Cicerelli this year, a 600 goal scorer and a hockey hall of famer. And I tell you what, I think it's the gal of the year. I'm, I really do believe it is, and we have a lot of fun. And uh, the Hotel Du Shaver is really excited about this too. Uh, I'd like to know if you guys can, we got a few tables left, if you guys would like to buy a table, it'd, it'd be great. Yes. Uh, it, I think he's looking for a soak. I got Councillor Strange and then I got Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I'll, I'll put in a motion. I just like to make Oh, if you remark, sure, yeah, of course. No, I just want to thank uh, Lutzi for coming down. He's, he was an uh, idol of mine growing up, and my, me and my dad used to watch you and the Lerner and the rest of the boys. Yeah. And Pulse Wires and They're all coming back for yeah. the roast. They're all coming, which yeah. is awesome, right? Yeah. And then the stuff he went on as, uh, you know, Zach Lates uh, in the NHL with Chicago and mm -hmm. coaching Tampa Bay. But, but I think it's it's the stuff that's uh, that you've done off, off the rank that's going to make you more famous than ever, and the stuff that you're doing for therapeutic clinic and stuff is helping so many people. So thank we you. want to thank you so Thanks, much for, for bringing this to the forefront and, uh, and helping all these uh, these people with Parkinson's and early stages of Parkinson's. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, you want to make the motion? Wayne, you, uh, Councillor yeah. Thompson, you want to make the motion then? For sure. Um, and, and we go back a long way. Uh, Burke Templeton. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, very hard. Uh, anyway, doing a great job and uh, we support you 100%. Thank you. So, you, did you want to make a motion yeah. for the tables? Yeah, yeah for sure. So, we're going to get, okay, so what are, we, are, we, are you getting two or a pair or what are you getting? Uh, two tables? Um, I think we usually buy, we got two tables. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I'd love that. Okay, so we got a motion by, can, what's that? Can we include uh, tables for the, uh, uh, we didn't have a, at our last meeting, we didn't have uh, Okay, so we got a motion. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, I got Councillor Campbell. So, so I got moved by Wayne Cam uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Campbell. Uh, any discussion of the motion? All those in favor? That's unanimously approved. So we're gonna look forward to the roast. I'm It'll sure be it's gonna be awesome. Great. It's gonna be awesome. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the, the backup. Thank it's you. always a great event. Thank we you. appreciate you doing this for us, Thank Steve. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've got two more other um, uh, deputations. We've got a request to speak from Charlotte King, the president of the Niagara Arts Showcase. 
Uh, it's listed as uh, communications number three. So um, if we could uh, bring her, uh, Charlotte up now to address council, we can uh, not have you have to wait around. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Diodati and council members. My name is Charlotte King. I'm the president of Niagara Art Showcase, and this is our administrator, Lori Lacoco. Niagara Art Showcase is a not-for-profit organization that supports artists and musicians in Niagara Falls, along with providing residents and visitors the opportunity to enjoy the arts and culture. Uh, we're here to tell you about our signature event that's coming up. It's the Carmel Fine Art Music Festival. It's being held September 15th to 17th this year, and we're happy to have a new home at Fireman's Park. It's an indoor-outdoor show, and it will be held rain or shine. Uh, we begin the evening with an artist soiree uh, on September 15th from 7 p.m. until 10 p.m. Oh, I'm sorry, 11 p.m. And it provides the public with the first viewing of the festival's juried fine art and the local high school's up-and-coming uh, art show. Guests will have the ability to mingle with the artists while enjoying wine or d'oeuvres and the musical entertainment, along with the presentations of, of awards. The tickets for the soiree are $15. And then on Saturday, the uh, festival rolls out from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and on Sunday from 9 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m. And we'll be having things like art in a variety of mediums and styles, dozens of musicians playing throughout the weekend, the Children's Creative Art Zone, art installations that transform the perception of space, uh, live art artists that will be creating a series of work live at the event, uh, community art mural installations, and everyone is welcome to add to it. And the admission for this is $5, and children under tw uh, 12 are free. There'll be a lot more as time goes on. And uh, we would like to thank the Stamford Centre Volunteer Firemen's Association. They've been really wonderful to work with, and we're excited to form a partnership with them. Uh, we'd also like to thank the City of Niagara Falls for awarding us Niagara Falls Cultural Development Grant. And these funds will help us present an excellent event, bring money back into the community, give local artists and uh, some really great exposure and provide residents as well as visitors an opportunity to enjoy the arts and the culture in Niagara Falls. We're asking for the City of Niagara Falls to waive any fees associated with the event and finally, we would like to volunteer. We would like to ask for volunteers or help in any way. And if they would like to, please visit our website at carmelfineart.ca. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you very much. So we've got a request that we waive the fees associated with the event for September 15th, 16th, and the 17th. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor Strange and seconded by Councillor Campbell. Is there any discussion to that? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Great. So thank you very much. Good luck with your event. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, and I've got one other um, deputation presentation. Uh, Councillor Volpatti uh, has requested uh, a brief update from the region um, on what's been going on. Uh, we, there's been a lot of things going on. We've been meeting. We had meetings today too, as a matter of fact, and tomorrow. So Councillor Volpatti, if you'd like to, uh, wherever you prefer. You can do it from there if you like, or there, no? Oh yeah, up at the mic, I'm told, yeah. Oh, up at the mic. Yeah, because our live streaming. Uh... Oh, right. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, for our council and residents, just a few notes on what we're up to at the region, the constructive things that we're up to at the region. Um, first of all, the Niagara Prosperity Initiative. Um, every year, the region donates, basically gives $1.5 million to not-for-profit agencies throughout the region. Um, it's done with a review committee, uh, of which I'm a member. And this year, 21 projects from 15 agencies across Niagara were approved. The Niagara Prosperity Initiative focuses on neighborhood-based interventions and development to increase prosperity. We use a mapping tool so that only those neighborhoods that are really in need of investment are up for consideration. The types of projects we consider are shelter assistance, educational programs for children and youth, life skills programs for adults, and job-specific skills. 
the committee is about 12 people, I think, and we and try to, there are three count, Niagara Regional Councillors and then representatives from across the region. And this year it was administered by the United Way of Niagara Falls and Fort Erie. We do an RFP every year um, for that. We're anticipating that 5,556 people will be served, 589 new networks and partnerships will be formed, and a total of 320 jobs will be created. Now the organizations located or operating in Niagara Falls in particular received $317,300, representing 22% of all 2017 NPI money. And the organizations include Gateway Residential and Community Support Services of Niagara, that was 33,000, Hannah House Maternity Home, 11,400, Heartland Forest, uh, Nature Experience, 44,000, the John Howard Society of Niagara, 15,500, the Niagara Regional Native Center, 52,300, and Project Share, 161,600. So that's, um, it's a real benefit to a lot of people right across Niagara who are experiencing poverty, particularly children and the mentally ill that are close to our hearts. I'm really pleased to be part of this initiative. It's a key component to assisting very vulnerable people. Uh, the next one is intermunicipal transit. And I don't know, this probably isn't on your agenda tonight, but I know that you've been talking about it. Regional Council approved a report concerning the next steps for our important work on intermunicipal transit. We approved the formal creation of a staff working group that will consist, consist of staff representation from all 12 municipalities in the Niagara region to conduct the technical work and ensure all municipalities have a seat at the table. We approved the creation of a steering committee that will consist of elected officials from Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, Welland, and throughout the region. So we have the mayors of the Welland, Niagara Falls, and St. Catharines already on the group. And we appointed Chair Caslam, Pel Pelham Councillor Brian Beatty, Fort Erie Mayor Wayne Redekop and Grimsby Councillor Tony, Tony Quirk to also sit on this steering committee. I'd also like to highlight the focus Regional Council has placed on intermunicipal transit during this term. This is an, an initiative that we are all behind at the region and I'd like to thank Mayor Diodati and Chair Kaz and, and other mayors for all their work. And today we addressed for the first time our uh, master transportation plan which didn't include this intermunicipal transit, but it's a huge plan that I won't even tell you how much it's going to cost because it's, but that's over 25 years, so that's a long time. That, it's a visionary plan and it's really important. Uh, last of all, um, the uh, budget for 2018, we approved budget guidance because we like to have our budget <laughs> done before the end of the year, so we'll be having meeting, a lot of meetings from now until December. Uh, budget was, uh, guidance was approved at one and a half percent with an additional one half a percent earmarked for the upcoming 2021 Canada Games because that's an important part of what we do so we have to put aside enough money in the next four or five years to cover that. And we're also working on DCs and I see that's on your agenda tonight. Um, that's been a long um, haul with that but we've been flexible with it. Uh, we've listened to everybody. Development charges. For development charges, uh, sorry, development charges, right. And I'm a chair of that committee and um, you know, we have a lot of different interests there but really growth has to pay for growth. And we are at the bottom as compared to other regions in Ontario, I mean, the, with our the amount of our development charges. So they're going to be higher but um, these are charges that people who buy new houses have to pay in order to live in one of our great communities. So that's the way that is. We're working on our code of conduct, which has been referred to our new integrity commissioner who has now been hired for the next four years. And all the presentations we've received, all the work that's been done so far is going to ADR, which is the name of our new uh, group. And they will come up with a code of conduct, which we will try to approve uh, in the next few months. 
And really one of our big problems is that we don't want to end up with 13 different codes of conduct across the region. Because 12 municipalities and the regional code of conduct, think of how the mayor is going to <laughs> act in that kind of a system, like what is approved here may not be approved at the region. So we're hoping that we can get input from all of the municipalities so we can end up with a code of conduct that is somewhat the same across the whole region. And um, I think that's about it. There's a lot of other things, but those were the highlights I wanted to bring to your attention. Do we have any questions or comments for uh, Councilor Royal Patty? None. Well, thank you very much. It's thank not you. often that we get uh, updates in person. Appreciate you taking the time to uh, give us a verbal. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here. Yeah, thanks very much, Councilor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna move along in the agenda to item CAO 2017-04. The Code of Conduct for Members of Council and Integrity Commissioner Appointment Process. So uh, our CAO is going to speak to this next agenda item. Mr. Mayor, just a thank you. Have a brief presentation tonight on the item. The report and uh, draft Code of Conduct was circulated to all members of council in the agenda package last week. Uh, and I just want to give you a few highlights, maybe starting <coughs> off with a little bit of the chronology of uh, where we've come through provincial legislation, and it really dates back to uh, 2006. Bill, if you uh, wouldn't mind advancing the slide, please. Um, and Bill 130 at that time gave municipalities the authority to appoint uh, an integrity commissioner. Our council, based on the strategic priorities of 2011-14, uh, identified, identified the need to develop a corporate code of ethics uh, in keeping with our uh, um, recently approved strategic priorities after the election in 2011. And that led to an HR report where we did uh, establish and approve a code of ethics and conflict of interest policy. Uh, that document uh, applied to uh, employees as well as uh, elected officials. Uh, there was further legislation changes in 2014, and in January of 16, the Ontario Ombudsman was given additional powers uh, by the province, really dealing with closed meeting uh, investigations, uh, and that's really what their, that act did in terms of uh, expanding their authority. In November uh, of 16, uh, there was a department by the clerk uh, where council directed us to implement a code of conduct for members of council, and that's the report that you have before you tonight. So subsequent to that, just this past June, uh, past May, uh, Bill 68 was approved, and that had a requirement uh, that all municipalities must, and it's, it's not permissive, it's a, a shall and must, uh, approve a code of conduct. Uh, as I indicated previously, Part of that process is to have an integrity commissioner. And if you recall my conversation before council a couple months ago, we had hoped we could default that to the uh, ombudsman. Uh, and quite clearly the ombudsman has indicated that they have no interest in looking at uh, investigations that are under uh, this bill and that are investigations that involve an integrity commissioner and indicated we should go out and engage that integrity commissioner. So part of the report tonight also includes a process where uh, we would go through a, an appointment process for that integrity commissioner. So that's the, the first part of the chronology. So your code of conduct that uh, hopefully you've all had a chance to review in your package deals with a broad range of issues. Uh, it's dealing with uh, uh, different conflict of interest, uh, behavior at meetings, social media policy, uh, and that is what the, the, will base uh, any findings uh, or breaches that a, an integrity commissioner would find during any investigation on any breaches under our code of conduct. So what we're asking council to do tonight with respect to the code is to adopt the code uh, and there's two options that you have, and different municipalities across the province have taken a different approach to this. So council can choose one of two options. One is that you can impose, you can personally or collectively as a council 
impose penalties under Section 223 of the Municipal Act, or as some municipalities have done, they've delegated that authority to the Integrity Commissioner. And the Integrity Commissioner would be the one that would do the investigation and actually recommend the penalties that he or she believes should be imposed. So again, that's a choice. Council can either choose option one or option two. Uh, and again, it's, it varies across the province as to which municipality chooses which option, but they're both available to council. And that would be one thing that council coming out of tonight should choose. Now, in terms of the integrity commissioner himself, they report directly to council. So any complaint filed under this policy, uh, there'd be a report and that report would come directly to council. And again, depending on which option you choose would be council imposing any recommended penalties or the integrity commissioner would automatically be imposing those penalties. So their role is to perform an, an independent investigation looking at any breaches of the code of conduct that may occur with respect to the rules and policies. This does not govern employees. This is a code for council. Uh, employees are governed under different uh, pieces of legislation, include this council very familiar with um, Bill 168 and, and other uh, corporate policies that we have that govern our employees. So the reason why we're bringing this forward at this time is that the recently passed uh, bill and legislation received royal assent just pa this past May, and that's why it's timely for it to be in front of council tonight. So the recommendation with respect to the integrity commissioner is that we need to carry out an RFP process, and uh, subsequent to that RFP process, uh, we present a report back to council. In the meantime, as directed by the Ombudsman's Office, if there is any complaint that comes forward in the interim until we have formally appointed a uh, integrity commissioner under the RFP process, that our city solicitor would seek out independent individuals to conduct, conduct such uh, investigations until that formal appointment has been made. So Mr. Mayor, uh, tonight we're really suggesting that we endorse the document that we uh, proceed with the RFP process and that council really should choose either option one or option two uh, under the uh, second item in the recommendation in the report. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. CAO. I've got Councilor Morocco. Uh, yes, Your Worship, I'd like to uh, move the recommendation uh, put forward. Um, I'm not sure what the wishes of the council uh, colleagues are to adopt option one or two, but I think option two would probably be the best. The integrity commissioner actually um, provides us with the uh, recommendation and at the end of the day council still has the last say on uh, whether we accept the recommendation of the advice uh, that has been imposed uh, as to the penalties. Uh, I'm not sure what the... So you're... So you're, you're is, is it not both the same? We both end up having Well, no, the, the one is the, the integrity commissioner actually imposes the penalty and the other one is they would make suggestions and we would impose a penalty. So there's, that's the two options for uh, recommendation two. So I, I don't know either what the well, feeling. Um, okay, so I'm ready to If I could just clarify that. I also that. just want yeah. to point out that I'm glad that we're also uh, adopting something that also addresses social media. Yeah. Uh, I think it's about time that we do because everybody should be accountable for the actions that take place on social media and those that are posted on social media um, because it's another form of bullying. And I just don't think it's proper. So. Um, I definitely, I'm pleased to see that. Anyway, I'm willing to pass it, and I'm I'm happy to uh, say that either we, we take uh, option one or two, which is a council. Okay. All right. So she's kind of leaving it out there for some discussion. I don't know what the will of council is. If you want the integrity commissioner to be the ones to uh, come up with and uh, direct the the penalty, or if you like it to be given to us as options, and then we do it. So it's up to you, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I like the. Uh, um, social media aspect, I've been talking about that for a long time, 15-2, um, um, how does uh, somebody, uh, if they see something or if there's something there that is offensive, uh, untrue, uh, disrespectful, uh, how is that handled through the municipality? Mr. CAO? Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, it so has through, to be referred to the integrity? Yeah, so an individual that saw something offensive on, on a Facebook pay, uh, post or uh, in social media, um, 
the way this policy is, is written is that uh, it's up to the member, for example, to police their own social media sites. Um, if there was offensive material, uh, an individual could lodge a complaint. That complaint would then go to the integrity commissioner and the integrity commissioner would issue his ruling on whether he found the information offensive, whether it was an attempt uh, by the member to take that material down or not, or leave it, and from there would impose any penalty that he or she thought was appropriate. And um, what about when somebody posts something on uh, a council member's social media and they leave it up there? Um, what happens in a case like that? Well, if I could just draw your attention to 15.2, uh, the way this policy is worded, it says so use of social media to publish anything or to allow anything to be published on their social media sites that is dishonest, untrue, offensive, disrespectful, constitutes harassment, is defamatory, or misleading in any way. So it's the member's responsibility, if they have a social media site, to ensure that none of their posts or any posts that are on their site are untrue, disrespectful, uh, offensive, so it's their responsibility. So it all comes down to the integrity commissioner to uh, deal with these issues. Uh, yes, if, if there if there's a, a formal complaint. It, yeah, if there's a formal complaint process in the document. So, if somebody launched a formal complaint, that goes to the integrity commissioner. They review the material. They make a finding. Okay. Is it retroactive or is it just starting today? Anyway, um, today, yeah. We're having a, an election next year. I'm wondering if, uh, because this is so important uh, and it is utilized, uh, uh, bullying was the word, but uh, it's sometimes above and beyond that. And I'm wondering if uh, anybody, in fact, the uh, election process starts in, uh, I think, uh, uh, next year in what, August? Uh, no, actually, you can uh, you can register uh, in May first. May first. It used to be January. It's now yeah. May. So I wondered if there could be something, if somebody who signs up to run for office, if they could be included in the uh, social media aspect of uh, of this particular legislation once they formally sign sign uh, a document. I think, and uh, I, it, this refers to members of council, so this would be elected officials. So I, we'd have to check as to how you might monitor that sort of election campaign period, but uh, this policy would be to council members only. Okay. Well, maybe you could uh, look we can into follow that. Up on that. Yeah. See. I see the solicitor's making notes, so yeah. We could follow up on it. Yeah, and uh, I... Uh, prefer option one. I think this is the council's responsibility and uh, I would support that. Okay, Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, first of all, um, just a question to the CAO. This, this congratulations, this, this package that's been put together, who put it together? So, so what we've done uh, is I had my staff, uh, Ms. Morton uh, and the city solicitor, uh, they've reviewed numerous, I can't even say how many, uh, codes of conduct of other municipalities across the province. Um, this is what we viewed as sort of a best practice of, of what we thought the best of the best were. Uh, that's the document in front of it. It's been reviewed by legal, um, so that's how we've come up with it. Yeah. All right. So I, I have some positive comments that I want to make. Um, you know, on a number of occasions I've stood up and said, uh, during my term of office as an MPP, one of my best resources as a member of parliament was the Integrity Commission. Because I would often go to the Integrity Commissioner and, and ask the question, am I allowed to do this? You know, a constituent has asked me to issue some type of a letter or something, uh, and I'm not sure. And there were other things. So I'd always go to the Integrity Commissioner and I always got a ruling. So I think this, that was a real benefit, I think, for the council members have an integrity commissioner that you'll be able to go to to get some advice. And I'm sure that's going to be the same process. That's good because right now the way it is for any of us, we have to go to a lawyer. You're not going to go to Mr. Beam and not being disrespectful, but you're not going to go to Mr. Beam and you're going to go to some, a lawyer. And, and the lawyer may or may not have an understanding of municipal 
legislation, and you'll probably say something like, I'll give you my best advice, but it doesn't mean it's accurate. So I think this is really a positive thing. But the other thing is that for us as members of parliament, there was one integrity commissioner, and there was one code, like we all followed it. And I think uh, counts, uh, regional councilor Val Patty, uh, and we were talking for a little bit earlier, and I think this is really important because we have 12 municipalities. We could end up with 12 different codes. Now, you look at yourself, your worship, you're under a code that if we pass it tonight, that's the Niagara Falls code. Now, you're also gonna be under a code of conduct for the region, which will be a different code of conduct. So you could have a situation where under our code, you have committed a violation, but under the regional code, which is gonna be different, it's not verbatim as ours, you may not be. So the, really the point I'm trying to make is this is our really a golden opportunity. Uh, and I know you sit on the committee for the region and you're working on, on their code of conduct, so you certainly have a wealth of knowledge from that experience. But I think it's an opportunity for us to have a standard code if we work collectively together in the region. Because no matter whether you're a counselor for Welland or Port Colburn or Niagara Falls, wherever, you should be conducting yourself exactly in the same manner under the same code of conduct. You shouldn't have 12 different ones out there. So I'm, I'm thinking what we should be doing, and I know your motion is made with really a positive, positive reason, but I think we're kind of going a little too quick. And there are, with the region, and they've already hired an integrity commissioner, if I'm correct, they've hired one, and they're gonna use that integrity commissioner to give them some advice on developing their code of conduct. So you get, rather than just us trying to do it internally. I think maybe what we should take a look at, as opposed to just passing our own, and I'm certainly not being critical of, uh, of you, Mr. Todd, or the staff, you worked hard on this. I think we should be trying to work together with the region and other municipalities to try to have one standard throughout the, throughout the region. The other thing that crosses my mind um, is, well, if we go down this road, we hire one, and Fort Erie may hire one, Welland may hire one, and wouldn't it kind of make sense to have one integrity commissioner, or one agency, uh, they may have two or three that would work collectively together, that know they deal with one set of codes, the same no matter where you go, and so that we have a, a standard across the whole region. So I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe, and I'm saying this in a positive basis, not, not being critical at all, and I think this is, this is wonderful. The other thing that, that there's a benefit too, I mean, not just internally, but for the public, because now the public will have an opportunity um, if they feel that Kim Crater has done something that's inappropriate um, by not declaring a conflict of interest, they will be able to go to the integrity commissioner and file their complaint. That's now opens the door to that as well. We should understand that. And so we should ensure that we have that standard throughout the region. No matter where you live, you're gonna have one agency to deal with. So I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe we're going just a little too quick. And maybe we should look at um, not dealing with it tonight, having some conversations with the region. We've got a regional councilor here as well, yourself, and seeing if we can develop among ourselves in this entire region one standard that we can all follow for a code of conduct and for the public to have access if they want to file complaints. It's one standard that they, they deal with. So I think, um, um, and again, I understand your motion, but I think uh, maybe we should just put a hold on this and, and try to follow through and have some contacts with uh, some of the others and yourself with the region and some of the other municipalities to see if we want to collectively have one standard code of conduct. Um, and the only way I can suggest that is if we want to consider deferring this you know, with direction to yourself as the mayor and our CEO and to look at having conversations with the other agency. Again, I'm not trying to cut off debate and nobody has to second it, second it if they don't, don't want to, but suggesting that would be a more, because this is, and I'll close with saying this, like this is a very significant document. And I know the staff have put a lot of time into it, but this is, significant not just for us here that we're new we're elected but for future councillors or people who are running and councillor thompson made the point as well it's a good point 
when you have new people who are, are running, you should know what the standard code of conduct is, how they have to conduct themselves. There should be a standard f for that as well. So um, maybe um, I'll allow more debate, but I'm, I'm looking at maybe making a motion to defer but on a positive basis that we work with the region and, and some of the municipalities who can have one standard code throughout uh, the region. Thank you, Councillor. I've got uh, Mr. Beeman, uh, I'd like to weigh in. The difficulty we have, uh, we face, uh, They've been trying to get, as the clerk has been explaining, the former clerk was explaining for quite some time, they've been trying to get a common code of conduct for quite a while. Um, we, are, we currently have a statute that makes us have to have one. So my, I'm suggesting that, that the council creators, I don't want to discourage his initiative at all because it's a great idea having one code for everybody, but it would be a wise idea, I suggest, for council to have one in place while we're negotiating the other one because any day now the, the legislation could be proclaimed in force, in which case we have to have one. So that the, uh, the I think the council might propose to have its cake and eat it to put this one in place, knowing that as they go forward, uh, they will be, uh, look, we will be coming back to you with what results from the <coughs> negotiations which are going on between the, uh, the other, but that is we would be instructed to participate in those negotiations and bring the results of those negotiations back to council at a later time. So the council would not be at a, at a risk of being caught without a code of conduct, but we'll be going ahead positively towards coming up with a common code of conduct with all the benefits that Councilor Prater has just described, which make infinite sense. Just we're under a bit of a gun because of the existing legislation. Uh, that's the only reason why I propose not deferring, but certainly it makes sense to put this in place and then pursue with Councilor Prater. So, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. That makes a lot. It makes it so much sense. That does. I've got Councilor Iannone, Cario, and Morocco. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. To that point, Councilor? Well, yes, it was to his point that I wanted to speak to. That's okay. Let's I'll, I'll come back to you. Yes, I'll come back ahead. to you. Councilor Iannone? Thank you. There's two recommendations before us, and I, when we actually get to a vote on whatever it is, I'd like them split, please. Um, number one is to hire a code of conduct for members of Council, and I've, quite frankly, in the recent past, become quite knowledgeable about the Integrity Commission or the Ombudsman and how this should work. I too have read almost every code and decision made in the past little while in regards to Integrity Commissioners. And I'll say I think that we should be hiring an Integrity Commissioner. I think number one should pass. And I think we should, we do have a code of ethics, by the way, and a code of conduct. We've passed it, so we have an existing one. But in order to have public debate, and we should, you are in months of public debate right now for a document that's so important at the region. To pass it tonight and ram it through without any public input, I think is, is not the right way to do it. I think we should hire an integrity commissioner, pass one, and have that integrity commissioner work to help create, us, to create a code of conduct with our staff. That was the, if I'm not mistaken, and both you and Council for Patty are here, and Councilor Crater and I attended those public meetings at the region in regards to how hiring an integrity commissioner should work and how you create a code of conduct. We should have an expert advising us how to do it. I can cut and paste any document from other municipalities also, and I think this is a great document. It's something we should have had months ago, but I think we need to work with an integrity commissioner to do it. I think we should have a special public meeting have residents be able to give input because let's be clear, the residents are gonna be able to use this code of conduct to file a complaint against us also. I think it should be standard. I think it should be debated with the public. I think it should have the same time invested as is happening at the region. I don't think this code of conduct should be passed tonight. We aren't absent one. We just don't have an extended one. Um, as for number two, whether you use one or two makes absolutely no difference. Under the municipal act, you only have the ability to impose a reprimand and or penalty of pay up to 90 days. You don't have any wiggle room there. The integrity commissioner doesn't have any wiggle room there either. You can only do one or the other. So whether he does it or we do it or she does it or we do it, doesn't make an ounce of difference. There's nothing more you can do. We're governed under the municipal act. Anything outside of that is not something this council has control on. So I think number two is a moot point, but it's definitely something that can be debated by council. But I think we should pass one, have a public meeting, have public input, and have the integrity commissioner we hire participate in that. Thank you. Councillor Kerio, and then Morocco. Thank you, Thank you Worship. Um, I, I think we should pass this tonight, and I don't disagree that there could be some uh, public input after. We can amend anything we do. We can pass this code, and it can be amended anytime. If we see something that someone else comes up with that we like, 
that should be in our code, we can put it in our code. I think we should be leaders. I think we should be leaders and let them look at what we passed. And if they come up with something that's a little bit better, we can always incorporate it into our code. You know, there's some things that the region's talking about that I, and I've been following that I don't like. I don't like the fact that they think that you should be under the code of conduct sometimes and not other times. You know, people expect us to, to uh, conduct ourselves in a certain way at every opportunity. They elect us, uh, sometimes look up to us, and I think we should be here to set an example on how we act, how we behave, and how we conduct ourselves at meetings and in public and at home and everywhere. So I don't like that part of it that I see that's happening at the region, so I wouldn't want to have that in ours. Um, like I said, let's be leaders, let's pass this. If we want to go ahead and have a public meeting to um, talk about it after, if we can always add, we can always take things out. But I, I'm for, <clears throat> for passing it, and uh, we can amend it at any time. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Morocco. Yes, I'm going to uh, stand uh, firm and make sure that we do pass this hopefully tonight, because I think that it's important that we actually get that code of conduct, as uh, yes. Councilor uh, Cario indicated. And I think that's it's can amend anything at any time. I think the staff has actually put a lot of time and effort into preparing this. Not only have they prepared it, but I'm sure that all the documentations that they've already researched have had a lot of public input into it as well. And therefore, bringing back a lot of different municipalities, code of conduct that I think that we can try and work with. And at any time, we're always open to public input and we're always open to amending uh, this as well. I think that we have a responsibility to get this code of conduct in place. Uh, immediately, yeah, and it's too bad that the province actually should have maybe done it years ago, and maybe they should have set the code of conduct across the board for all municipalities to have one code of conduct. You know what, that's unfortunate, and I'll stand here and, and say that myself, being that that's the party of the day. But, you know, we have to make sure that we take a stand, and why do we need to wait for another uh, organization like such, such the, re the region or somebody else? If we've already got this started, good for our staff, good for us, Good to take a stand and let's move forward with mo uh, making the motion and pass this tonight. So did you want to make the motion then, Councilor? I, I did make the motion and I actually said that if uh, one or two was the option, but if we need to go with the integrity commissioner be uh, delegated to authority, uh, uh, the delegated authority to impose the penalties under that or council, I think what, uh, and I'll just check with, uh, but I think it's just one because basically we're still going to get the information back because the integrity commissioner is going to still go and be doing the report. It's going to bring back the report and then it's going to be given to us. So I'll actually go with option one. Okay, and there's been a request to split the, uh, the recommendations. So I've got a motion. I need a seconder for that. I have a seconder mm -hmm. by Councillor Cario. Uh, did you want to comment, Councillor Campbell? Yep. Thank you, Your Worship. I do believe also that we should pass this tonight. However, I would be more in favor of uh, option two. Uh, from my limited experience, I would suggest that the integrity commissioner would have more knowledge of the specifics of the situation that we're dealing with. And I don't want to be in a position where uh, judging my peers uh, based on it, not having all the information. I would prefer that the integrity commissioner make that decision. So I cannot support uh, uh, the first motion, or the first option, option, option one. one. Yeah, Sorry, Councilor. Councilor. But will we not be getting the recommend recommendation back from the integrity commissioner? We'll, we'll give we'll the CEO so to explain. That's kind of confusing because I didn't understand which one is. So Mr. Mayor, uh, if I may comment. Because I totally so support that as well. Under option one, what would happen is that the integrity commissioner would carry out his investigation, he or she would carry out that investigation. And like the integrity commissioner did here a couple of weeks ago, they stand at the podium, they make their presentation. Then it would be up to council to impose whatever of the two penalties that they would want under that uh, section of the act. Option two would be the integrity commissioner would come and make his presentation at the podium make his presentation and say, and here's the penalty I have imposed. So they would have already imposed the penalty, recommended the penalty, and council would not have a say in which one of those two penalties it would be. So you're delegating your authority on the penalty to the integrity commissioner that does the report. Okay, uh, where am I at here? Okay, uh, Councilor Craig. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just gonna follow up, um, I understand what, uh, Council Cario saying about being a leader and it does make sense. The only thing is I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around um, the situation that we can run into 
where 12 mayors and you're in that situation. So if I understand everything correctly, and I know I do, you can have that situation where someone can file a complaint against you under our code of conduct for Niagara Falls, but can also file a complaint against you under the regional's code of conduct for exactly the same reason, nothing different, and you'd be found guilty in Niagara Falls, but not guilty at the region. So we can run into that. So that's where I have, that's why I have the concern. I just think there should be one step. But I realize what you're saying, how difficult it is to get all the missing, well, valleys get, I just, um, and the only other thing is I do believe, um, and I'm not trying to contradict with what you say, but it almost, you know, it almost be like saying we're going to have a planning matter where we'll, we'll vote to rezone the land and then we'll listen to the public after the fact and decide if we want to change our minds then. I know it's not a, but it, you know, you kind of get that feeling. I think, I think at the very least, we should at least have one meeting to let the public look at this and just say, have some input or do you support it or do you have any suggestions? I think we at least owe them that. That's the only reason that I don't, that I won't be able to support it because I think we owe it to the public. It is such an important document and, and it, it goes to our credibility as a council that, that we're open, we're transparent, we're going to let the public have some input into uh, a major document like this and that's why I feel strongly about it. Um, not trying to be critical any way of the staff or what they put together because again I can see they've done a lot of good work on this. So that's why I can't support it. Only because I think the public has a right. That's the only reason. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you want to weigh in? Can I see it? Mr. Mayor, just the one comment that uh, if, and really the only ones that this would apply to would be the 12 mayors. And I would think that once integrity commissioners were in place and there was a complaint made, I think the first thing that, that if it was against a mayor, that the integrity commissioner would determine is that in the carrying out of your duties as the mayor or is it a member of regional council? Because when the mayors sit on regional council, they are members of council, they're not the mayor. So um, I, I would think the integrity commissioner's first job would be to find out where that breach of the behavior or, or, or code occurred. And it would be that integrity commissioner that would carry out the investigation. You, I don't think you would have two integrity commissioners simultaneously carrying out two different investigations about that individual. So um, I'm pretty sure that's how the process would, would follow through. Councilor Thank you. If we're going to pass this tonight, then I guess ask the questions through all the different issues that I have with this, because I thought we'd have a chance to debate. First of all, I just want to say, Councilor Crater, a number of times said, you know, I don't want to contradict staff. I don't want to, debate is open discussion. You don't have to agree with everything. That doesn't mean you're being critical. It's called debate. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. So I'm, I'm not, I, I just think having a difference of opinion doesn't mean you are being critical. It's just not what you think. It's just not what I agree with. I'd like to go to purpose and principles 1.3D. The conduct of each member, dem member demonstrates fairness, respect, and differences in a duty to work with other members together for the common good. Also, A, the decision-making process of council is open, accessible, and equitable and respects the city's governance structure. How would they deem to be breached? So through staff, as, this, as you're saying these will be our rules, explain to me what we would do to have those two items breached. Well, that'd be the integrity commissioner that would be you looking at this, not staff or council. No, the rules have to be in place for all of us. If you are passing these as the rules that we have to conduct ourselves on, I need to understand them. So what exactly does our staff think the decision making of process is open, accessible, equitable. What, do, what exactly does that mean? And the conduct of each member demonstrates fairness, respect, and differences. We're apologizing here for not agreeing with each other. That's, disagreeing with each other isn't, isn't a crime. It's called political debate. So can you explain to me what that actually means? I don't have a problem with you passing this, though I think it's the wrong thing to do right now. Five beats four but I want to understand what you're passing. And there are dozens of clauses in here that I'm going to ask questions on because I'm not quite clear what staff's trying to get across. Well, I, I'm going to ask our CEO to talk to it, but I would say these are the purpose and the principles. 
and then as you go through it, there's the actual, the member shall, the member shall not. I mean, these are just purpose and principles. I think these are kind of um, a general um, opening, preamble to the actual uh, rules and regulations that we're gonna abide by. So that's my take, and I don't know if there's a different but, interpretation. But, we'll but if that's start. not my take, I'm about to ask the question here. And that's all I want, is I want to understand this document before you pass it. I don't think anyone's questioning okay. or limiting debate. I don't so think that's... I, I would say that, the, Mr. Mayor, to your point, the, 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 the preamble, if you were the purpose and the principle, are, are, are guiding, uh, guiding overarching uh, uh, principles that w would govern your behavior. <coughs> the Integrity Commissioner would be guided by those overarching principles, but it's, it's some of the detail in terms of the breaches where he would be using those as guiding principles, he or she guiding principles to determine when you get into the further detail on the breaches, because the specifics come in the actual uh, different articles in, in the document. So one of the things that they would be, if you look at DE, for example, uh, that each member demonstrates fairness and respect uh, for differences, that's a guiding principle. Um, in his findings on a specific breach, it may offend that principle but um, the breach is going to be in the detail of the other articles, whether it be on, you know, uh, social media or harassment, um, use of city property. Um, those are where the details are going to be found in terms of the breaches. So, um, Mr. Mayor, to your comments, those are most documents will have overarching general principles that will guide that individual during their investigation and that's how I would view those those principles in 1.3. Thank you. Council? A, the decision making of council needs to be open and transparent. Well again, it, the same thing applies. Uh, there may be a complaint uh, that, um, you know, that there was some, you know, secret meeting taking place or some secret discussion taking place, uh, that they may have evidence that in fact did occur. And this is just, again, a guiding principle to say, well, the process should be open and accessible. So it would be a guiding principle that would lead him or her the, to determine that if there was evidence that showed there was a meeting that went on improperly, that's a that's an overarching principle that would guide them. So, yes. so the comment was made at the beginning of this: the ombudsman has no dealings with the integrity commissioner. That's not quite true. The ombudsman oversees the integrity commissioner's office. So any investigation done by an integrity commissioner can be investigated by the ombudsman's office. That's a fact. So they sit under the auspice of the ombudsman. So as you're going through the, uh, the actual document then. There can I get clarity on that? Well, okay. Mr. Mayor, I, I don't believe that's a true statement. Um, okay. We actually have a letter in our possession. Uh, let me rewind the tape a bit. Uh, when we had a, a, a request of this council to investigate uh, an incident here several months ago, uh, the first call I made was to the ombudsman's office and they say, we don't get involved in those complaints. You must hire an integrity commissioner. Came back to this council and that's exactly what we did. Uh, the letter from the integrity commissioner basically said they do not get involved in integrity commissioner complaints. That you hire an integrity commissioner the code guides the integrity commissioner, the integrity commissioner does his report, and that's the end result. And that's exactly what we did. And I have to say, that's wrong. I know that because I'm going through the process right now. I will forward you the, uh, the letter from the ombudsman that explained to me they do not get involved while the integrity commissioner is within his investigation. But once the investigation and the results have been provided to a council and a, somebody complain, files a complaint about the integrity commissioner's conduct and or how he conducted his investigation, the ombudsman investigates that. And I will tell you, I already have confirmation from the ombudsman's office that is taking place right now in regards to Mr. Duck's report. I told you I was going to do it. I did it the next morning. The investigators already been allocated. 
So I know of what I speak. I'm not going to stand here and, and talk about something that's not fact. So I can happily provide you with that direction from the Ombudsman's office. There are, you, you, you have to separate those two issues. They don't get involved during the investigation, but they do investigate how that integrity commissioner conducted it while it was taking place, not while it's actually taking place. So I just want to clarify that. I'm not going to stand here and say something that you can correct me on when I'm in the midst of that process right now. Do you have any other uh, things you want to talk about on the code of conduct? I do. Under compliance with the code, 4.3b, no member shall obstruct the integrity commissioner or any municipal official involved in applying or furthering objectives or requirements of this code in carrying out such responsibilities or pursuing any such objective. Define obstruct, please. Sounds self-explanatory to me. Well, I, I would view that as interfering in any way with the investigation. Okay, so the integrity commissioner has rules on how they do their investigation and how somebody has to participate in that investigation. You have that highlighted in this document. At the last council meeting that I was at, the inference was made that I didn't participate in the investigation with Mr. Duxbury. I have 24 emails that say different. I have 10 emails that show he didn't respond to me once. Didn't respond to one question I provided. So in this document, how do you tighten up how an integrity commissioner does their investigation? Because obstruct has lots of different premises. So set rules. If you give a rule and the integrity commissioner has rules on how you have to conduct yourself, how can this council overrule if you follow the rules of the integrity commissioner's office? Well, I think what he, the integrity commissioner said was you refused to meet with him. So, Your Worship, to that point. Yes, council. Sorry, that point. You know, I, I'm sorry, but I think our motion here is to deal whether we're going to pass a code of conduct, not to deal with another issue that's already being taken care of and that's already been acted upon. I don't think that's what we're here to do. You want to debate what's happened here with the councillor and whatever, but that's not what we're doing right now. I think that we, as elected officials, it's pretty simple. We have a responsibility as elected officials to act in a, an according manner. We have a uh, responsibility to do a due diligence as an elected official. We are supposed to act and conduct ourselves in a professional manner, not just part of the time, but all the time. That's the way I take it as an elected official, and I truly believe that we do have a responsibility, as they stated back in 2006 when they actually put in the uh, amended act, to actually bring forward a code of conduct for us. It's long overdue, and I think that it's about time we take a stand and actually start putting something in place. And this needs to be moved forward. It's plain and simple. I don't want to get into any other issues that have taken place. I think we're dealing with this right now. And eventually, after this is dealt with, then we could actually make amendments once we have public meetings or other consultations that people want to. But I think we need to act now and do something responsible and act like we are mature elected officials doing our due diligence for our constituents. Thank you very much, Councillor. Yes, Councillor. And, and I agree with her. Number seven, in, in how you're going to, in compliance with the code, undue use of influence. No member shall use their status as a member of council to improperly influence the actions or decisions of staff or others to the private advantage of the member or his or her family members, friends, associates, business, or otherwise. Can you, I, I already thought that was part of our policy. This council can only act as a whole. No council can call staff and say, I want this done, and it's done without the will or support of council. So can you explain that to me? I don't know, it's self-explanatory, Councillor. I don't Mr. Know. Mayor, but it's not. Because we're supposed to be here discussing this document. I'm asking questions. You think it's self-explanatory, I don't. So I'm asking staff to explain that, please. Councillor, I'm, I'm just not quite sure you, what you want me to explain. Uh, it's. Is that not already what we do? It is, but it's restated here because you're formalizing it as a policy tonight. It, it, it in my mind, makes perfect sense to repeat it in this document. Is it already a policy of the city that that can't happen? 
Well, we it currently is in our code of ethics. We, okay, we're that's saying, all I want to know. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may, the code of ethics and uh, policy that we have today, what the new legislation passed in May of this year is indicating, and this was even raised by Mr. Duxbury in his report, and by the ombudsman on a couple of occasions to us, is that you should have an independent document that specifically and exclusively deals with council. That's what this report does tonight. And you ask why that clause is there? Because you should repeat it in this document that will, will apply only to council if passed tonight. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't something that wasn't already in existence. I mean, the, the former clerk told us that a hundred times if he told us once. This council cannot act independently. They have to act as a council of the whole. You can't be directing staff for, or, or abusing your position to get things done for you personally. I just wanted to make sure that that existed before tonight. That's all. Is there any other uh, questions you have, Council? <clears throat> yes. 12.2. Members shall seek council approval for the use of their names or position and title in the official name of any event where fundraising activities occur. So we have to come here, get a motion of council to be Councillor Iannone or Councillor Strange is holding an event for important issues in the public? Because we haven't done that before up to now, so I'm just curious, do we have to come here and if, if I want to host something very much like the, the two fundraisers I did for mental health awareness or Councillor Strange just did for cancer awareness, do we have to come to council and get a motion that we can be Councillor Iannone or Councillor Strange hosting this event? Well, what that says, Councillor, is that if you're going to be using your formal council title, that's what that section says. So we have to come here prior? You would have to inform council that you as Councillor Strange are running that event. And I think that what happens in most cases anyway. But if you're out there just as an individual running an event, you do not need, you don't need that. If you're going to use your formal council name, because council would have to know if there was an event that a council was running that was not befitting of the image or whatever the community, uh, and you're using your council moniker to that event, um, you know, I think this council should have the ability to say you shouldn't be using your council name for that event. So that's what that section says. Thank you. So that's just for fundraising events? Yes. Okay, thank you. Follow motion. Okay, we've got a. Request to call the call the motion to that to that councilor. No, I just uh, want to. How does this relate to a council member with respect to staff people? Uh, if there is harassment or some kind of uh, individual on staff that is being harassed by a member of the council, does this cover that in any way here? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It could, uh, but there's also Bill 168, uh, which refers to the workplace. So uh, staff could, uh, if they felt uh, threatened or harassed, could file a, a complaint under Bill 168. That could be one avenue they could take. I guess there, there is another avenue where the, it could be a, a, a complaint under the uh, Integrity Commissioner. Uh, it would be one or the other. I would think in most cases it was a harassment complaint and it was an employee that was being harassed by a counselor, they would follow under Bill 168 and follow that process through. Okay. Yes, counselor. And that's sitting in our present code of ethics right now and in our harassment in the workplace policy. So if in the past, any complaint about a counselor had gone to the CAO, the head of HR, the city solicitor, well, actually counsel can only go to the CAO. So if our complaint goes to, if a complaint from a staff member or a fellow counselor had been made to the CAO, would that have had to be based on the code of ethics we have in place right now, automatically investigated? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's not under the code of ethics. Under Bill 168, uh, we, I'll defer to the HR director, we have an obligation. So as soon as we receive a complaint, uh, we have an obligation to carry out an investigation under Bill 168 on that complaint. So. Uh, that 
unfortunately happens quite regularly in the HR director and, and his staff are, uh, it's not something we would come to council and ask for approval for. It's, it's basically an automatic under the provincial legislation. Yes, council. Thank you. Here is our harassment respecting the workplace policy. And it says that if any complaint has been made to a director, it automatically has to be referred to Mr. Dark and investigated on a member of council. I'm not talking about staff, just in regards to the nine of us. So if you've received a complaint about a member of council prior to tonight, you would have had to, under Bill 168 and our harassment policy, file a complaint with Mr. Dark and Mr. Dark would have had to have that investigated. I just want to make sure I understand. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call the vote. There's a motion before council. We're going to split the vote. Yes to that point, uh, Councillor? Thank you. I, have, I just, I'm going to be voting against the motion, and I just want to make it clear. Certainly not opposed to what we're going forward. I just feel very strongly that, yep. that the public deserve and have the right to at least have some input before we passed it as opposed to afterwards, and that's the only reason. I still think your, your point's well taken that we should be a leader and there's nothing wrong with that. But I just feel strongly about the public input part. Of it. Well, I feel good that we can always amend this. And I've got a feeling when the regional comes up with one or the province does that we can adapt that. But in the meantime, we have something to live by. And I think uh, people want us to hold council to high standards and I think this will do that. So we're gonna call recommendation one. Mr. Mayor. Yes, council? In recommendation one, it says the code of conduct and the integrity commissioner appointment process be attached. I'd like to support the support hiring an integrity, uh, putting an RFP out for an integrity commissioner, but I do not want to support this document because I also think it should have public input and it shouldn't be rammed through in one evening. So can we split that actual number? So vote on hiring an integrity commissioner, but not, I, I'd like, a vote for hiring an integrity commissioner than a vote for approving this code of conduct. I'm going to ask our clerk. Can that be done? Well, I'm going to ask our clerk to make a ruling if that can be separated or if one is in integral to the other part in within one. Well, since we have a motion on the floor already uh, presented by Council Morocco, uh, we could ask for a friendly amendment there. Okay. Okay, so council, we're gonna, we've got a motion, uh, moved by Councilor Morocco and second. Recorded vote. Recorded vote. Okay, we're gonna get a recorded vote, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Okay, if I'm understanding this correctly, it looks like we're just going to vote on, firstly, the recommendation listed as number one in the report. So we're, we'll be passing a recommendation for the code of conduct of members of council and the integrity commissioner appointment process attached to this report as addendum one be approved. Uh, answering in favor or opposed, Councillor Campbell? I have to ask a question. Yeah. Are we voting on whether it's council that makes No, that's the second part. Yeah. Right now we're just doing we're it. We're just splitting it for recommendation number Can one. In favor? I didn't quite hear, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't quite hear what the clerk uh, said. We're voting on we're just voting right now because it's been asked to split the recommendation on recommendation number one as listed in the report. And that is the code of conduct and the appointment of the integrity commissioner. That's right. Attached. We're just That's pointing right. on the integrity commissioner. That's it. The code of conduct and the integrity commissioner. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Councillor Crater. I'm opposed. Thank you. Councillor Ryan Oney. Opposed. Councillor Curio. In favor. Councillor Morocco. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councillor Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? Yes. And Mayor Diodati? In favor. And it's passed. Okay, thank you. So, recommendation number two um, we've got a motion that Council, right now, currently, Council Morocco made the motion that we go with option number one, where Council would impose the penalty that would have been recommended by the Integrity Commissioner. So the Integrity Commission will make a recommendation, Council will make, impose the penalty. Okay, so, and that's been seconded by Councillor Thompson. So that is part two. Okay, recorded vote. Okay, that'll be recorded as well. <coughs> okay, part 
Part two to the motion, the recommendation that council choose one of the following options. Uh, actually, I'll just reread that. That council impose the penalties under section 223 of the municipal law. Answering in favor or opposed, Councilor <coughs> Campbell? Opposed. Councilor Crater? In favor. Councilor Iannone? In favor. Councilor Curio? In favor. Councilor Morocco? In favor. Councilor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councilor Strange? In favor. Councilor Thompson? In favor. And Mayor Rudet? In favor. Yes. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to our planning portion of our council meeting. Right on time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now in the planning portion of our council agenda. We're going to deal with PBD 2017-24, and I now ask our city clerk to bring us forward. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed plan of vacant land condominium at the lands on the north side uh, of Oldfield Road, east of Dorchester Road. Notice was given in accordance with the regulations by prepared first class mail on Friday, June 9th, 2017 to all owners of land within the area to which the application applies and to all owners of the land within 120 meters of the applicable land. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our director of planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose of this application. Thank you, Worship. This uh, property is uh, a parcel of land on the north side of Oldfield Road, east of Dorchester Road, and it's uh, adjacent to the uh, Oldfield Road plan of subdivision. Uh, to the north of the property is a Hydro One corridor. To the south are provincially significant wetlands. To the uh, east is actually a vacant property now, but proposed for townhouses and further east are, is a uh, plan of subdivision largely composed of single family houses. The property itself is uh, 0.087 hectares, uh, probably about a one, one acre in size. It's proposed that this property be uh, divided into vacant uh, lots, which would be then sold uh, for 35 townhouse condominium units. Uh, the lot area per unit is 249 uh, square feet. Uh, Council will recall this land was previously before them uh, for rezoning. It was subsequently part of a Committee of Adjustment application which reduced the lot area from 250 square feet, or square meters rather, per unit to 249 square meters per unit. Um, the, uh, Applicant, as I said, is proposing a vacant land condominium for 35 units. The lands were originally intended to be a stormwater pond, but due to uh, infrastructure design, the pond was no longer necessary. So the land uh, is now available for development. Currently, uh, there is a uh, mound of topsoil uh, that uh, <coughs> was stripped from the adjacent lands and stored on this property. The uh, plan of condominium is intended to uh, allow the property divided and sold as separate units. The uh, plan will have a common roadway, visitor parking and amenity areas. The uh, scale and height of the proposed buildings are compatible with the surrounding dwellings. The developer will be required to enter into a condominium agreement with the city. The land is developed as a vacant land uh, and therefore it's not subject to site plan control because the condominium agreement will control the development matters. The uh, official plan designates these lands as residential. There's a special policy attached to these lands, 
which allows the lands to be de uh, developed in advance of a secondary plan for the Sunny Waters area, provided that uh, it meets the appropriate uh, provincial densities of 53 jobs and people per hectare. Uh, the proposed development has a uh, density of 40 units per hectare and about 50, er, excuse me, <coughs> 100 persons per hectare, uh, which will assist in meeting the densities uh, in the uh, secondary plan area. The proposed development is considered compatible with multiple housing forms. The zoning for the property is zoned, as I said previously, as residential low density group multiple. Uh, the, there was a variance obtained which reduced the lot area requirement per unit from 250 square meters to 249 square meters. This allowed the development of one additional unit, so going from 34 to 35 townhouses. The um, staff has concluded that the application does comply with the official plan. It's compatible with the surrounding development. It will assist in providing housing choices within the city and that the city, regional, and Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority interests are addressed through the conditions attached to the report. The staff is therefore recommending that the Oldfield Phase 4 vacant land plan of condominium be draft approved subject to the conditions attached in Appendix A to the report that the mayor or his designate be allowed to sign the draft plan um, within 20 days of council's decision and that the draft approval would be given for three years, after which the approval will lapse unless an extension is granted, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the condominium agreement and the, um, the documents required for the future registration of the subdivision when all matters are addressed to the satisfaction of the city solicitor. Those are the highlights of the application. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Are there any questions from Mr. Hurlovich of council? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives. And if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting, council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to this draft plan of vacant land condominium. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Okay, seeing none, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. All right. All right, good evening, Council. My name is Jordan Vanderhoeven, and I'm a planner for Upper Canada Consulting, and I'm here today representing our client, Mountain View Homes, in regards to this application. Um, so a little bit of background for the site, kind of touching up upon what was previously stated, is that the site was previously subject to a zoning bylaw amendment, which was approved by council on October 25th of 2016. This amendment permitted the rezoning from permissions for a stormwater management pond to now permit the residential uses proposed in the application. Um, and in regard to granting draft approval, there were no objections upon circulation to the region, municipal works, transportation services, parks design, fire services, then PCA, Hydro One, Bell Canada, and Canada Post, as all potential concerns are covered in the conditions of draft approval in Appendix A. Um, and so our client slash the owner of the site, Mountain View Homes, is ready to move forward with the application and in his agreement with staff's recommendation to grant draft approval as seen in the recommendations report. Um, so a little bit of history. So the old, so the um, the Oldfield subdivision. So the subdivision is located in the Drummond community, identified in the official plan, and is in the southern portion within the city's urban area. The first two phases of Oldfield consist of 245 single detached dwellings and 10 townhouse blocks. While the third phase, which abuts to our site to the to the east, consists of 10 townhouse blocks as well. Or sorry, the um, the first two phases consisted of six townhouse blocks. While the third phase, which abuts to our property, consists of 10. Um, so the subject site fronts onto Oldfield Road, as highlighted, um, fronts onto Oldfield Road, which is an arterial, an arterial road. Um, so, the, so the application, the plan will divide the land into 35 townhouse units with private road access. As mentioned before, the site is located on an arterial road and will provide two access points onto Oldfield Road. The plan meets all requirements in terms of official plan site density targets and zoning bylaw restrictions due to the rezoning amendment, which was approved by council in October of 2016. And in regard to the surrounding uses and impacts on adjacent properties, north of the site is a hydro corridor and south of the site is a wetland where no residential dwellings exist and are permitted. East of the site is phase one to three of the Oldfield subdivision, which is currently under construction 
and we'll have townhouses, which are currently, which is a currently vacant site abutting to the east, but we'll have townhouses in the future. And to the west of the site is a small parcel, which will be, a, which will be the final phase of the subdivision. And based on the surrounding uses, we believe that there will be no negative impact on these properties. Visitor parking and amenity space is provided on the site, and overall the plan is in complete accordance with the, appropriate, with the approved zoning. Um, so the concept plan for the units is to consist of two-story townhouse dwellings. Um, the unit concept design fits in well with the first three phases of the subdivision and will not have a negative impact on new residents, on new residents in the previous phases, and the design conforms to the surrounding area slash future surrounding dwellings. And so in conclusion, our client is in agreement with staff recommendation on the approval of draft plan status and the related conditions. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Any questions of council for him? Yes, Councillor Ainoni. We are, we have for a very long time been getting complaints from residents who live on Dorchester Road in regards to the heavy trucks, the dump trucks, the mixers, everything that goes down their road. Um, we've all been getting them recently. We got one this evening, who, uh, a resident who is opposed to this how are we going to enforce to the residents that there'll be an alternate road used and the, the heavy trucks going down Dorchester Road are going to be discontinued? Because right now, we've dealt with this issue more times than we can count. They don't believe us when we tell them we're going to find a way to reroute them because the rerouting's not taking place. So how are we going to enforce that? Uh, are, do you have a tra transportation uh, plan in that regard? Um, I do not have a transportation plan on me in that regard. I know for, for this site that it is just direct connection off the artillery road, um, Old Field Road. So I believe in regard to, um, I don't know, it'd be pretty, pretty typical. We'd have to abide by all the standards that would be I don't know, appropriate for all other subdivisions within the city. Councilor? Thank you. And, and with the emails we recently got from Ms. Bain and the email we got today, we told them before Oldfield Road would be used as the arterial road, and the arterial road is still being is still being utilized. The one that's being utilized is Dorchester Road. So we have complaints of, of dump trucks going down with no tarps off, houses being how uh, foundations being ruined because they keep hitting the same bumps in the road all the time. Um, they start at six o'clock in the morning. They go to late at night. Sundays also. I mean, the residents aren't making these things up, and we don't seem to be able to provide them any relief. How are we going to enforce that they use Old Field Road and not Dorchester? Because if you have a transportation plan, can that be provided to us? Yeah, I think for um, for this site, the only access to the site is actually off Old Field Road. Mr. Lovich, it is just a want? private. Uh, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, Mr. the Lovich. council takes a look at the map. The only way to reach Old Field Road is from Dorchester or Drummond, which is not shown, but. Drummond is to the east, so the trucks have to come along Oldfield and either go up Dorchester or up uh, Drummond Road. I suppose they could go, you know, west down Dorchester towards Chippewa Creek Road, travel along Ch Chippewa Creek Road, which is basically a, a tar and chip road. I don't know that that makes sense. That road will be broken down quickly, so um, I fail to understand the Councillor's question as to how we would fly the trucks out. Yep, Councillor. Well, I think the residents would like to see us fly the trucks out because their homes are being damaged. This this isn't a new issue. Now they're looking at a couple years more of development out there. We need to have some sort of method to alleviate the traffic that's going down that road. It's terrible. If you've ever gone to sit on Miss Bain's front porch and watch the trucks go down. It is endless, and it really does start at 6 o'clock in the morning. We got the same complaint today by, I can't, I'm sorry, the, the gentleman's name is eluding me, but we got the same complaint today. They are putting up with it every day as they have for years. We've told them we can fix the problem. How are we going to fix it? Well, my question to staff is, do we not have a 7 o'clock, uh, are they not allowed to, have, or don't they have to wait until 7 o'clock to start construction in the city? Mr. Yeah, the noise by the noise bylaw is it doesn't regulate that it basically says construction equipment seven in the morning to nine at night and then on weekends uh, on Sunday it's uh, from nine to nine so um, you know so so we can, we can send out letters to the contractors what we hear from the contractors is that it's the subcontractors who are making or driving their vehicles uh, in off hours but we can Send them the reminder that they have to cannot be on the roads prior to seven and have to be off the roads by nine p.m. 
I guess it's a good uh, it's a good start, at the very least, to send them the letter. But uh, it's it's frustrating for sure. It is. Yes, Councillor. Through you to Mr. Holman, have we sent the contractors those letters over the last couple of years? Mr. Holman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, we've been trying to wrestle with this since I think original complaints go back to 2011 when the uh, Thundering Waters condo development was under construction. Um, and uh, we've been working with the developer and trying to use the clause in the subdivision agreement that reminds them of the, uh, uh, the noise bylaw parameters. Unfortunately, the developer's coming back to us and saying, well, Okay, but those people don't work for us and we don't have control over their operations and then they hire subsequent people. And so it's been ineffective uh, for us to use a subdivision agreement to, uh, to deal with something like noise. Now we have been able to cut down on dust, uh, fouling the road, uh, we've patched potholes, we've fixed shoulders, uh, and thanks to the, the patience of some of the residents that have been living in that area, we've, we've been able to work through those issues. The noise one is something that we have really struggled with. And we can send the letters out if you want, again, to the various contractors that are being reported as violating this. Uh, the fact of the matter is they're on the site, they have a license, they can operate uh, their vehicles in accordance with the, uh, the Highway Traffic Act, and we can't really stop them. What's the consequence if they um, start before seven? Do we, is there anything that we can? Uh... Well, uh, we would have to uh, you know, take uh, precautions or, or take the steps uh, through uh, the enforcement of our noise bylaw. And, and I'll have to pass that over to uh, uh, Alice, I guess, or to the solicitor who can tell you what the process might be for uh, that, that uh, taking those steps. I mean, I don't know if it's a volume thing or a speed thing, if we had to slow the traffic down, uh, maybe we need to do something like that. I don't know, maybe we need to refer that piece to our staff to help mitigate some of the traffic and transportation. Well, um, yes, Mr. Slicer? I, I think the really only enforcement's only effective if you've got somebody who can catch them. So I think if you really wanted to, uh, to crack down on this type of thing, we have to have people in the field who are there when the offenses take place. So that would, that might, um, we could look into, you know, I, unfortunately the pilot guy's not here, but anyway, what we could, we could look into uh, developing some kind of scheme and price it out for you as to what kind of cost and so on, that sort of enforcement would be. Um, but with noise violations, you have to catch them doing it, especially when you're dealing with <coughs> the of people as Mr. Holman describes. It's not like a factory or uh, even a barking dog. It's at the same house all the time. Like these guys are gonna be coming and going and you're gonna to have to catch them in the act. And you know, as Mr. Holm was explaining, when we go to see the contract, you know, it's the subs who are doing it. When we go to see the subs, he says it's the contract. So you actually have to see it so that you don't get the he said, she said. Okay, thank you, <coughs> Councillor. So is, is the solicitor asking, should we make a motion? I'll put a motion on the floor that the solicitor, that they bring back, staff bring back a report giving us options that we can do for enforcement and that we would implement in a very timely manner. But I wanna say, failing that, I would rather see us tell the residents what Mr. Holman just said. Outside of that, there's really nothing we can do. And they understand there's really nothing we can do than us saying to them on the phone, okay, we'll get, a, we'll get somebody on it right away. And they expect us to fix the issue. I'd rather be blunt with them and say, they're not, they're, you're not doing anything wrong. This is how they're gonna to have to do their job rather than us say, you know, politically it sounds great for us to say, okay, let us fix it, but if the reality is we, reality is we can't, I'd rather tell them that. Well, we can do that after, because we have a public meeting going on okay. right now, so after okay, we can do it. Councilor Crater, did you want to speak to that issue too? I did. I, uh, first I want to thank Mr. Holman and his, his staff. I've probably uh, been in touch with him by email and by phone a number of times over this issue, and uh, they sent me a copy of the subdivision agreement. I, analyzed it to see if there's anything, could we put a greater deposit on the developer so that if he's violating the subdivision agreement that dealt with noise or the trucks or that he'd pay a financial penalty. And I thought I said, maybe that's something the council should look at. It's exciting when we see development. There's nothing wrong with that. 
but it isn't exciting when you live on that area and all of a sudden your world has changed. And, and Councilor Ioni is right, for the people who live on Drummond Road or live over on Dorchester uh, every day, <coughs> that's what they see constantly. And, and yeah, there's a frustration because it feels like, uh, and she's quite right, it just feels like nobody, nobody's doing anything and they have, we don't live there. It's not what we see every day in front of, if I saw it every day in front of my house, trucks going by, and the noise, the dust, and the, I, I'd be down at the council, I'd be down at City Hall asking, you gotta do something, I live here. The other thing is the road's being destroyed. So, you know, that was a question I asked, who's gonna pay for that road? When, when, when Oldfield's done, who's gonna pay for the destruction of Drummond Road and Dorchester? I'm not being critical of you, sir, not at all. But, and I was assured that the developer is going to be responsible. Am I correct? The, develop, the damage that's done, and there's a lot of damage. Those trucks are heavy. You drive out there and you'll see it. And is it a dust bowl? Yes. In fact, in some places out there in Oldfield, um, the subcontractors, they use some of the area as a landfill. And you can go out there and you can smell it. And we're sitting in this room and it's kind of nice. We don't have, but if the, you had the garbage that's out there where some of these people are living that they're seeing sitting right here in the center of the council, we'd be screaming to you, why would you bring that in here? That's not right. So that's the world they live in every day. So I, I think what frustrates me is we have development for the right reason, but in our excitement for development, we forget about the people who live there. We forget about the consequences that they're facing every day, and when they call any of us, I don't have an answer to give to them. Uh, for example, I'm getting more calls now. We need more police, Kim. In fact, I talked to uh, Ch uh, Inspector McCaffrey. The residents down there want more policing. They want police down there so they can watch the trucks, so they can see them. See them. It's a moving violation. It's not one that our city staff is going to go out there and issue speeding tickets, and they feel they're speeding. They don't have the tarps on. Dust is flying everywhere. Moving violation. That's the police. So now there's more of a demand for police because of the things that are going on. So, and there's no, you're right, there's no simple answer. Can you solve all these before I sit down? Sorry, the issue of no, routing sorry. Damage, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. But you, you understand what I'm saying, and I know you're sympathetic to it too. Um, so let's, let me just close with this. Can we do anything with the subdivision agreement to put a more, um, greater deposit that they have to put down, so if there's damages or complaints, or if the, the, the subcontractors that these people use are violating it, then the penalty comes off of the deposit they put down. And maybe, you know, money does talk, and if they feel that they're gonna lose it, they're gonna make sure the subcontractors they put out to are gonna follow the rules. Is that asking for your advice? So Mr. Holman, uh, two parts to that. So one is, can we ask for more of a deposit from the developer, number two, the road, that's getting chewed up down that end, uh, who will be responsible for for fixing it? Okay, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, and great questions. Uh, we can deal with items such as, uh, no, as uh, dust and nuisance, uh, like blowing uh, garbage and debris from construction uh, through the subdivision agreement. And we can hold on to securities, we can ask for additional securities if, if that's the way to do it. Uh, because that will force the developer then to uh, include some of these responsibilities in their subsequent transactions with builders or individual homeowners. Uh, the issue of noise is not something that we can deal with effectively through a subdivision agreement because it really depends on the operator of that particular vehicle. So um, perhaps we can come back with some more suggestions as, as you have uh, requested. Uh, to the, the second part of the question with respect to uh, upgrading Drummond Road. They are collector roads. The conditions are, uh, before construction, uh, weren't great anyways. Uh, we're hoping that once the construction is completed there, uh, that we would uh, uh, advance uh, some reconstruction. I hate to I hate to penalize the residents who are living in this area who have been living in a construction zone for the last seven years uh, and reward them with more construction, but um, it's, uh, we're kind of waiting for them to finish damaging <laughs> what, they, what they've started, and then we'll come back with some capital projects in subsequent years. 
um, their contributions won't be through development charges. They will come through increased tax assessment, which we'll use to to fund the replacement of those buildings. So okay. maybe, uh, I'll just close with this, Your Worship. Maybe what we could look at, I think we should look at, is this, the thought that revisiting the subdivision agreement and tightening up the financial rules so that uh, if there's violations to it, then they're going to pay a penalty for it. Maybe the, and you, you know what we're looking at. Uh, maybe at the end we can look at that, making a motion, not just for this one, but for the future, because there's always development going on. So at least developers know they owe it to the people who live there to be respectful of them, <coughs> to treat them with the dignity they deserve that live there. So maybe afterwards. Yeah, afterwards, maybe okay. you and uh, Councilor Anoni can right. put together Thanks. a report to come back. Yeah, that's a good idea. Are there any other questions here for the presenter in regard to the proposal for a vacant land condominium? Okay, seeing none. The public meeting with respect to the proposed draft plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. Look for a motion from Council. Councillor Cario? Move the, Move the recommendation. Seconded by Councillor Strange. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Okay, on to the consent agenda. What's the, oh, no, we got, I'm sorry. Oh, right, right, I'm sorry. Do we need a motion for that before Mr. Smith? Do we need a motion, Mr. Clerk? For the... Oh, yeah, you mean for your, yes, 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 please. Did you want to make that? So I move that staff bring back a report to give us options or schemes, as it was said, in order for us to be able to limit, particularly the dump trucks that are going down without a tarp covering covering whatever it is they have in there because that's becoming very problematic with the neighbors around there. Okay, um, and also did you want to add to, uh, and also the idea of the uh, penalties, uh, stronger penalties or stronger, if you want to include that yes, in this I, report. I would. And I'll second the motion, Worship, but I'll okay. that, thank you. So did you get that, um, Mr. Quirk? Did you get that? And then uh, to work with Mr. Holman to come back with a report on what else we can do to ensure that they uh, stick to the rules of the subdivision and uh, the damaging of the roads. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Ken, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed secondary plan for the Grand Niagara area. Notice was given in accordance with the regulations by publishing a notice in the Niagara Falls Review on Saturday, July 17, 2017, and by prepaid first class mail on Friday, June 16, 2017. Anyone who wants further notice shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Now if I get our Director of Planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed amendments to the official plan. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, hopefully this presentation isn't too long, but it is, is wordy because it really is a, uh, a large planning area. We're really covering all the land from the west side of the QEW, west to Crowland Avenue, and from the Welland River in the north down to Bigger Road in the south. So it's a large area, most of which is owned by uh, the Grand Niagara Golf Course uh, people, but some of this land is also privately held, uh, uh, particularly along Montrose Road uh, and, Ly and Bigger Road. Um, the uh, proposal is that it is a secondary plan. It's being brought forward largely by the uh, developer of the Grand Niagara Golf uh, Course. It is an amendment to the official plan. It would provide detailed schedules and policies that are going to divide the, or direct the future growth uh, and establish design criteria and protect the natural heritage of the area. This is our future growth area of the city. The uh, Planning Act requires that amendments have at least one open house and one statutory meeting uh, prior to adoption of the amendment. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to be, receive formal comments from the public. We have been working with uh, the landowners uh, directly affected. Um, but we also want to have the uh, public and, uh, and interest groups uh, affected by this de future development uh, share their views as well. The uh, consultants around investments 
have been in consultation with city staff since 2015 to develop this secondary plan for the Grand Niagara secondary plan area. The land uh, is approximately 330 uh, hectares um, and it includes, as I've said, vacant lands, lands of ES Fox, uh, Minex, uh, the proposed hospital site. Uh, the lands proposed uh, for the hospital site will be following the provincially led planning process. The golf course lands are currently designated open space and environmental protection, uh, as well the uh, po special policy area provides for development of the growth uh, golf course and associated residential uh, accommodation, which includes uh, hotels. The uh, lands are within the urban boundary. Bigger Road marks the southern extent of the city's urban boundary area. The uh, lands are considered to be within the built area of the uh, city of Niagara Falls. This is under the growth plan of the province, um, and therefore they're not uh, required to uh, comply with the greenfield densities of 53 people and jobs, but they have to uh, meet the intensification uh, requirements uh, under the growth plan. The area is uh, serviced through the Grassy Brook uh, pumping station, and these uh, attributes assist staff in being able to consider the secondary plan at this time. The uh, lands are largely to be designated residential. You can see that illustrated in the yellow tone on the map. Uh, this is where the existing uh, golf course is now. It also includes uh, single semi-detached street townhouses, block and stack townhouses. There will be approximately 1,100 to 1,400 dwelling units. As well, there are areas identified for mixed use. Uh, it's that reddish tone on the map. Uh, so basically, the, the uh, mixed uses are commercial residential development and particularly multi-use buildings, which would be residential and uh, commercial or industrial uses together. Um, there are natural heritage areas. So uh, the larger blocks are uh, identified as uh, significant Woodla woodlands, some of them are PSWs, provincially significant wetlands. Uh, the linear uh, green lines through the plan are the existing water courses. Uh, all of these courses uh, were studied uh, through an environmental impact study at the time that the golf course was proposed and identified the floodplains and the buffer areas adjacent to those. So all of those are identified for conservation <coughs> use only. The employment lands, these are largely the blue lands on the map. Um, so these, uh, the light blue is the hospital and uh, medical precinct uh, campus that would be uh, developed at the south end of the city. The um, darker blue lands are largely the, uh, the employment lands. This could be um, manufacturing as well as warehousing and trucking facilities. The total build out for this area would be approximately 3,800 to 4,600 people and about 3,800 jobs. The um, residential mixed use area would provide between 1,460 and 1,900 dwelling units. Overall, the plan area will develop as a complete community. That is that there will be residential, com uh, commercial, institutional, and employment uses uh, provided within the plan. The, um, there are some issues with respect to separation from adjacent industry. Uh, SciTech is located to the northwest uh, at uh, Chippewa Creek Road and Garner Road. Uh, there is a, um, a existing policy in the official plan which protects an area of 1.09 kilometers from the corner of um, Garner Road and Chippewa Creek Road. That is the shorter line uh, but the furthest away arc on the right hand side. So uh, the official plan basically says that there can be no residential uses, no overnight accommodation within that area, um, no areas uh, where there would be a assembly. Um, the developer is requesting that that arc be reduced to a two kilometer arc from the plant. So that is the phosphine plant of, of SciTech. Their arguments are that uh, that's the same distance separation which the uh, industry used for uh, the Warren Woods plan of subdivision to the north. It's the same distance separation used between industry and 
Heartland Forest, and Heartland Forest has their interpretation center, a, a place of assembly, and so they're saying if the, the two kilometer arc is a more recent arc, established for those types of uses, it should be applicable here. Um, our staff recommendation is that, um, next slide, is basically that uh, since there's no agreement, in fact, council has a letter uh, in their package, or it was a handout today, uh, from um, Jeff Wilker on behalf of SciTech, outlining that they have concerns with respect to any development within those arcs, and so staff is recommending that any uh, residential use within those arcs uh, be deferred to allow for uh, further investigation and uh, discussion uh, with uh, SciTech. The uh, uh, SciTech's position is that the 1.09 kilometer arc should be maintained, no residential accommodation and no assembly uses. Uh, as I said, given the opposing views, uh, we're recommending that that area be deferred uh, from consideration uh, in this uh, secondary plan process. Uh, the natural heritage areas, um, as I said, there are water courses that extend through uh, this area. Those are protected areas. There are some large blocks of land which are uh, significant uh, natural heritage features, but there are some uh, adjacent um, uh, areas which are considered non-significant uh, heritage features and through the uh, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority's um, current policy regime, you can um, provide for the removal of that, provided you compensate with um, natural heritage features elsewhere. So those uh, measures are outlined in the Appendix 3 of this report and uh, would require that they be anything, any lands that are non-significant be replaced uh, one to one uh, by, um, uh, within that watershed. The um, preservation of existing features uh, altogether would represent um, uh, an area where they would be maintaining and restoring and enhancing the ecological functions that improve the landscape connectivity uh, between the forested lands, that create an interior uh, forest habitat and improve habitats for species of concern uh, for conservation. Restoration works would guarantee the uh, agreement with RAND and the uh, man-made features and the timing of the restoration work would coincide with uh, development. Um, the planning of the, of the proposed secondary plan is under its final review by staff and agencies. Uh, staff is supported of the proposed uh, plan as it represents a detailed policy framework that will guide future development over the next 10 to 20 years. Development of the secondary plan will contribute to the provision of the city's long-term growth. Natural heritage will be protected and enhanced through the uh, ecological uh, natural heritage system and the staff and agencies will complete the review. So that's part of the purpose today is to get additional comments that we can review with the uh, various uh, other departments and agencies. Um, therefore, we're recommending that council receive this report for the purpose of accepting input from the public, that this be considered a mandatory meeting under the Planning Act, and that staff continue to, uh, with its review, and bring back secondary plan to council for a decision at a later date. Those are the highlights of this application. Thank you, Mr. Herlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Herlovich? Yes, Council Morocco? I just have one, I just want a clarification. It says uh, re redevelop the golf course. The golf course is staying. Or this is no, talking about no, the, the, the golf course would be gone. So now we're going to wipe out the golf course for development. Correct. It's urban land. <laughs> Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, through you, your wish to Mr. Hurlovich. Uh, years ago, when the golf course came into play, uh, we made some concessions based on the use of the land with respect to roadway allowances, property of the city of Niagara Falls. And I do believe that if that golf course was not going to be continuing, that the lands that we were dealing with at the time would be reverted back to the city of Niagara Falls. Um, yeah, I don't know the details of that. The city solicitor might have that information, but the uh, plan on, on the screen actually shows us. Yep. 
point row. So the, uh, in actual fact, Grassy Brook Road, which extends through the golf course now, we closed it approximately here. There are a number of houses on the south side of Grassy Brook Road. So this plan provides for the extension of that road. So Grassy Brook extending from Montrose Road through to where it uh, continues west towards Port Robinson. As well, we closed Crowland Avenue. This plan proposes that Crowland Avenue would be reopened. Um, we do need some more discussion. The intersection of Crowland with uh, Bigger Road at the railway tracks is a dangerous intersection, so that will require some realignment and some redesign. But those two roads that you speak of are in this plan um, to come back and be public roads. And would that uh, cost of that happening be part of the, the uh, development or would that be attributed to the city? That would be, they would be now developed to municipal road standards and dedicated as part of any subdivision like we would any other subdivision in town. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crater. Thank you, Worship. Um, you know, I do remember, you were here as well, Councillor uh, Campbell. I remember when we approved the golf course. I remember the place being packed and all the controversy about allowing the golf course to go in there. And I ended up, I supported it. Not because I'm a golfer. Councillor, can you direct your comments this way, please? Oh, you're over there. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, Worship. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the only point I was going to make is um, it was pretty controversial allowing it. But those of us, at least for myself, we supported it because it was going to protect the land. You know, they, I remember them saying there's no better mechanism to protect and preserve land than by putting in a golf course. They're going to make sure that it stays pretty well intact the way it is. So I guess I'm just kind of saying, strange how it was yesterday it was allow a golf course, that's going to protect and preserve the land, and now we're sort of going in a whole different direction. The, the golf course is gone. As one of the premier golf owners in Niagara Falls, too, I'm sorry to see it go. But more importantly, I kind of feel bad because the land that we thought we were protecting and preserving for the right reasons for a golf course is going to be going to development. And the only other thing, Your Worship, and maybe I can just get an answer, I didn't know now, I just saw for the first time that natural heritage that, that you can, through the Conservation Authority, I didn't know their policy was you can recreate natural heritage land somewhere else and, and cover off, you know, develop over top of an existing one. I didn't realize that was, you're on the Conservation Authority. I'm just asking you, I didn't know that, that that's a policy. Is that something that's been around for a while and I just missed it? I'd say we probably, it would have to ask Mr. Hilovich if he could comment on that. It, 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 it is biodiversity but by another name, compensation. Uh, so um, yes, the Conservation Authority has a policy now for non-significant. So you know, quite different than what this council dealt with previously for another development or another secondary plan where they're proposing um, whether a, a great number of provincially significant wetlands. So the PSWs are being protected. Those are the green areas on this plan. So this is a PSW. This large woodlot here, it's a wet woodlot. That's a PSW. This woodlot is a PSW. Along the creek is a uh, PSW. There are wetlands along the uh, shore of the Welland River. So those are all protected areas. And then the creeks that flow through are um, protected because there is a floodplain associated with those streams as they come down to Grassy Brook and enter into the uh, Welland River. So uh, all of those are being protected. It's the nat natural areas that are of not of significance. So along the railway tracks, there are some natural areas in here. The proposal is that yellow area, and this is be a refinement that we'll bring forward to Council in the future. That, because it's surrounded by PSWs and, and uh, protected lands, is almost impossible to get at without disturbing that. So this would be an area where we would allow regeneration of the natural forest and environment in compensation for the removal of green areas in this area here. That's a, a one example. There are a couple of other examples as well. All right, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. Councilor Morocco. Uh, Your Worship, just uh, to you, or, or maybe to through you to Alex or to Garcia, is this, 
is this a way now of the future here that we're actually going to be looking at selling off golf courses and converting them into residential whatever? I'm just kind of sad to think that, you know, what we've this destination is known for the beauty of all of its golf courses and its vineyards. And is there no way that we can protect the golf courses that are here? I mean, people actually move down here and locate in certain areas. I know down in my area there, there's uh, a number of people that came and selected homes down in that area due to the fact that they were surrounded by a number of golf courses and uh, natural beauty and forestry. So I'm just, you know, is that is that where we're going now? We're just going to allow golf courses to be sold in which we thought we were trying to protect some type of greenery? Mr. Hilovich, And do I you truly don't believe in biodiversification because I don't know that they've ever tried that either, but anyway. Um, we don't own the golf courses, so someone privately owns them. They have now thought, seen that they would rather develop it for residential purposes. Uh, to the council's point, I can tell you that I'm aware of one other golf course in town. We're in active discussions with that developer about uh, converting that from golf course to housing as well. So, so but this is not, not the only one. So do we not have the uh, no, authority Brett's to? No, it's private property. That's what he's saying. So are they not, have they not been protected though in a special taxation through them as well? I think there's. I don't, Mr. Hilovich, do you know uh, about I that? don't know how resident or golf courses are taxed. Mr. Harrison, do you have any? Uh, Mr. Beeman? Golf courses enjoy an uh, artificially low tax rate as a result of an arrangement that was reached between the, uh, the provincial government, well, MPAC, and the golf courses some years ago. Okay, any other questions or comments of council? Okay. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives. Do we have anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Okay, so we can come up one at a time. If you would just state your name and state your address, please. John Balker, I live at 134 Church Street, St. Catharines. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. I, it's a 10 minute limit. I did give a, a flash drive in advance of the meeting. Maybe it could be shown to members of council. All right, here's John Bacher, favorite pastime. That's a very large old growth oak tree. We're here at the Grand Niagara golf course. And John, would you like to say anything about this area? Yes, um, this to my mind looks like an old growth forest. Now, it was originally to be protected in the uh, baseline report by the uh, uh, firm Savanta because it is recognized as provincially significant forest uh, environmental conservation area in the regional plan. But they, in the current concept plan, they took away all the forest protection of this area south of Grassy Brook Road. And they said we could actually duplicate the ecological function of this forest through offset. And they would create a new forest near Bigger Road and uh, bigger, uh, a mile away. How are you going to replicate an old growth forest? Think of how long it will take, a hundred years. It could all be destroyed in a tornado. It could never come to be. This is an absurd notion. And they kept quiet about it being an old growth forest because then the absurdity of, of what they were proposing would be clear to everybody. Thank you. Could we now put up the um, what was shown as the planning analysis um, by the planning director? 
I, I hope to reference it in my talk that were, where it had green on the map. There was one with yellow. Yeah, th that's fine. Background's fine. Now, where I took that um, photograph, it, Adrian Williams did it. Dan Ardones here helped me with editing. It, it's right there south of the provincially significant wetland. That is identified in the EIS as a significant forest. That means it's an environmental conservation area in the regional plan. That is proposed for offsetting. Now, I disagree with the uh, planning director where it's proposed to have the offsetting. My view is that they're from reading the EIS, that it's in this area near Bigger Road. He indicated it was in that area there. The area that he indicated that the offsetting would be done, he said it would regenerate over time, it's clearly identified in the concept plan as residential. So I believe that is a significant error in the analysis of the proposal. Now, the report, this is a dry forest. It is legal to have offsetting, although I certainly don't recommend it, for dry forests and non-provincially significant wetlands. What was attempted to do at Thundering Waters was offset provincially significant wetlands. But there is another feature. The report proposes to offset 11.3 hectares of land, which should have been clearly mentioned in the staff report. But it's not exactly mapped where it is. I was able to find out between the concept plan and the reports prepared by the proponent. Now, part of this 11.3 acres is what is called non-provincially significant wetlands. And if you read my brief to you, which was not referenced by anyone before now. You will see that in the peer review on the Thundering Waters proposal, done by North-South Environmental, they indicate that it is required in the secondary plan process to reevaluate the non-provincially significant wetlands. They indicate it's wrong to propose offsetting at this stage the wetlands should be reevaluated. And I think it's also appalling that this report from Leif Leffler, we only have because Ed Smith here, that we know about this report. He made an Access to Information Act request. We had a public meeting that was announced in the Planning Act, and nobody was given the contents of this report. And we had a long discussion Mr. about. Can you keep your voice down, please? Yes. Well, I. Thank you. I know you're. Emotional. I wish that you had, Mr. Mayor, that you had released this report before the meeting. Mr. Smith's report indicates <coughs> continuous efforts by you to change provincial policy to permit offsetting on provincially significant wetlands. Is that in any way related to the proposal before you tonight? Well, what does relate is the matter that there should be a peer review of this development. And there should have been a reevaluation of the provincially significant wetlands that are proposed to be offset. We don't even have the area precisely mapped in any of the materials prepared by the consultant of where the 11.3 hectares are. I felt like I was Sherlock Holmes wandering around there to find out this area. 
and they follow the map and they find this old growth forest with giant trees in an area to be offset that the consultant did not rec acknowledge there were old trees over a hundred years old, a giant uh, beech trees, giant hickory, giant oak trees. Now, all my recommendations would probably only eliminate 5% of the area that could be developed. 11.3 hectares is quite small. Apart from not having the 11.3 hectares offset, I recommend a change in the road plan. There should be an extension of EPA designation from the provincially significant wetland to the Welland River that is following the natural heritage guidelines which the developers consultant Savanta Mr. Bacher direct your comments yes, this which way which the development you've got 2 minutes left Savanta cites but does not acknowledge that if you look at you have online you have computers you can go to the Ministry of Natural Resources natural heritage guidelines they have a map of an isolated wetland like that. They said that is completely contrary to the natural heritage guidelines. So my view, the Savanted consultants are completely ignoring the guidelines that they misleadingly cite in their document. Proposals I've made also would reduce road mortality. It would encourage cul-de-sacs and, and dead-ending of roads to effectively both benefit the community by traffic calming and also uh, uh, reduce wildlife mortality, making it a safer neighborhood for both children and wildlife. That is my comment. Thank you. Anyone else here other than the applicant? Yes, Councilor Iannone. Uh, does staff have, through you, Mr. Mayor, does staff have any comment on Mr. Bacher's comments that the consultants didn't give us the information we need to make proper decisions? Mr. Erlovich? Um, yeah, Your Worship, at this point, um, I haven't looked at that EIS myself, uh, but Mr. Bacher and I spoke earlier in the week, and he did identify uh, certain areas. I gave an example of the area that would be offset, um, and he identified other areas, so there are a number of areas that can be identified, but you know, the purpose of today's meeting is to get these kinds of comments. And I think given what we've heard tonight, we will be working with uh, the um, uh, RAND and requiring that they uh, outline specifically for us so that we can bring back uh, a more informed position to council. Uh, this is certainly information that's come out to me in the last um, week, with this week. As I said, uh, Mr. Bacher was in, or Dr. Bacher was in, uh, earlier this week and we spoke. So Thank you. I, w I will follow up. Thank you. Councillor? Uh, Mr. Bacher also referenced the report that Mr. Smith made available to him, who made available to us about Leaf Leffler. That That's we, right. Why were we not given that when we are in, in all the information we have to make decisions? Mr. Erlovich? Um, typically we don't give council all of the reports that we get. We get a planning justification report, we get transportation reports, servicing reports. Um, we can make those available. Um, typically, we don't. But uh, any of the councillors uh, are welcome to contact me. I'll share everything. Councillor? Yeah. And, and, and on that note, I'll get a copy of that. But the reality is we don't know to ask if we don't know what's there. So I don't mind you providing all of that to me when I want to make an informed decision, but I can't ask for something I don't know exists. In fairness, there's no decisions being made tonight. No. This is just for feedback. No, I do understand that, but this is supposed to give us everything we, we should know to make an informed decision. And There's I, no decisions being made tonight. But this is leading us to a decision. It is leading us okay, there, yes. Okay, so give me everything we need to make okay. one. Okay, so you. Mr. Levich heard that. Uh, next speaker, yep, if you'd like to step up. 
Yeah, we'll get you. We'll get to everybody. You got 10 minutes. Your name and your address, please. Uh, Daniel Nardone, 95 Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, I'm actually just coming up here to bring some comments about this and just a little bit more broadly, but I won't go too off topic. Um, I guess uh, my comments really for this development is, like I said, is essentially like say to avoid, you know, the notion of offsetting at all costs really because it's been scientifically unproven that, um, as you know, it takes a long time for nature to do it, work its course. Um, and so basically, just what I would propose is that make sure that you have 30 meter buffer zones around development to the naturalized areas uh, so that um, like fireflies and um, what do you call it, um, gray horned hours I think it was, and um, bats basically don't get affected as by the say uh, light pollution. Um, and I guess just on a more, um, I was going to say like positive note about Niagara Falls because I mean when Canadians think of Niagara Falls they, the natural wonders of well, the falls themselves. Um, and uh, I was just gonna s suggest like how at Brock we have a uh, phenomenal outdoor recreational program and go looking into the notion of um, like ecotourism because um, as it turns out, the Carolinian zone of which Niagara Falls is in is very, very much, it's under, under threat of development and um, Countries like New Zealand and that, who uh, you know are you know doing a lot of ecotourism, and they're even bringing in the film industry um, and stuff like that, you know, because just as natural heritage. Um, but really, I think like when you think of places like you know the Thundering Waters, or and there's also the uh, the Glen, the Niagara Glen, like these magnificent areas that you could connect with, like uh, eco or like corridors and wildlife corridors that they could, you know, wildlife could uh, go over or overpasses like you see in Banff National Park. So what I'm more or less just kind of putting out there is like, yeah, we're in Niagara Falls. We've got this magnificent Carolinian forest. Why don't we look at ecotourism as, as well as, because I know we have conventional tourism, of course, but that's really just my comment, just to kind of put that imagination or that concept out there to you, Mr. Mayor and members of Niagara Falls City Council. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Next, uh, anyone other than the applicant? If you can state your name and your address, please. Hi, uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Is that all yeah, right? yeah. Good evening, your worship council members. My name is Glenn Wellings, and a planning consultant for SciTech. And uh, your worship with me tonight is Mr. Ken Milo and Miss Amy Mather, uh, also of SciTech. Um, Mr. Hurlovich mentioned a detailed letter that was submitted by Mr. Wilker uh, earlier today. Uh, that has been provided to council. I know it's, there's a lot to that letter, a lot of information. But just to summarize the concerns, Your Worship, uh, SciTech and its predecessors have been in the city for over 100 years, and, and I think council knows that. Uh, SciTech has recently expanded operations, uh, resulting in a significant community investment and uh, many jobs and they're simply wanting to protect that investment. <clears throat> Given the nature of their use being the manufacturing of chemicals, it is an ongoing struggle for SciTech to protect its current operations from encroaching development. And it's been a struggle, and I know many councillors around this table have been here for some time and uh, have seen SciTech from time to time, but it's, it's um, it's a constant struggle for them to protect their operations given the nature. It's not an operation that you just pick up and move somewhere else. It's, it's, a, it's a very specialized operation uh, with uh, many uh, interesting components. So the purpose of the, the previously mentioned ARC that uh, Mr. Hurlovich uh, covered mm -hmm. off in his presentation was and remains to this day, um, the intent is to protect the SciTech operation and the risk of that operation and the encroachment on of sensitive land uses. So uh, there, there uh, could be some complications in the event of, in the event of an emergency and, and that's simply the purpose of that ARC. Uh, this ARC was negotiated before the Ontario Municipal Board uh, through a hearing. Uh, I was at that hearing and it was negotiated in good faith 
uh, prior to the recent SciTech expansion. I, I note that point prior to the expansion of SciTech. SciTech simply wants to ensure that any development within that, within this uh, secondary plan area, respect the ARC and that land uses beyond the ARC are aware of the SciTech operations. And again, if there is an emergency situation, they need to evacuate. Uh, people need to know that SciTech is there. City staff has suggested in their staff report and, and through Mr. Hurlovich's presentation that the area or land uses within the ARC uh, be deferred uh, to negotiate a solution at a, at a future date. Uh, I, I'm not convinced piecemealing this issue is, is the best approach. It's certainly something we'll talk more to city staff about. Uh, however, we, we, we are certainly pleased and, and we have had consultation with city staff as well as Mr. Baldessera, uh, the proponent. Uh, but I hate to set the stage that there is uh, a chance of, of negotiation here. Um, I'm not optimistic there is a solution at hand uh, for lands within the ARC unless those lands are kept as non-sensitive uh, uses. So I don't want to set the stage that, uh, for something that, that may not be achievable, but your worship and counselors, it, it doesn't mean we're not willing to talk and, 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 and sit down with the proponent and city staff and, and, and try and work out a solution. But, but at this point, I'm not optimistic. But uh, that's my comments, your worship. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the planner from SciTech? Yeah, yeah Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah, it always uh, bothers me uh, you put a almost two kilometer uh, radius around uh, a chemical plant. People own the lands privately. Uh, they're paying taxes on it. Uh, and yet you uh, have that circle there where you don't want to see any kind of development. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you try to, uh, and you've had government grants out there, uh, substantial amount of money to try to make sure if there is any concerns with respect to escaping gas, uh, why wouldn't you try to protect uh, within the property and within the building that you have rather than trying to uh, affect properties where people own them privately, pay taxes on them and have uh, uh, plans of what they would like to do. We yeah. see this constantly. Yeah, through, through you, your worship, to, to Councillor Thompson. Um, uh, fair question. Um, first of all, SciTech ha has a fairly regular, rigorous program of, of, of safeguarding their operation and, and, and looking after the safety of their operation. So they, they have a, a very rigorous process in place to, to, to avoid any, any issues. Uh, this ARC issue, Councillor, is not a new issue. It was an issue that was oh, negotiated, right. negotiated as I mentioned, in good faith with Grand Niagara when they were developing the golf course use. And, and there was agreement, clear agreement, uh, to avoid sensitive uses within the ARC. And that was agreed to. And, and now we're hearing that all of a sudden that's, that's no longer uh, a valid agreement. And, and we're having concerns with that. So I, I appreciate your concern that they may not want to do what they want to do within, within the ARC, but at the same time, this, this is not a new issue. It's an issue that's been negotiated, an issue that's been to the OMB, and frankly, it's not an issue that SciTech's willing to reopen. Yeah. Well, that doesn't uh, answer my question with respect to the people who own property and uh, have uh, uh, plans and what they would like to do with it and you draw an arc around, and they're paying taxes, they have expectations, and yet uh, uh, it just doesn't seem fair to me. Well, Grand Niagara, the golf course was able to achieve their plans with the arc, so I'm not sure why this Well, the golf course it fits in yeah. perfect with what it, uh, it does. Which was, you know, how, much, uh, how much did we spend to put services out there? I think we're still paying now for the service, I think it was, Fifteen million dollars that we put the services up there. Yeah, yeah, because there was a 
big debate <clears throat> at the time. So there are services out there that uh, uh, contemplate uh, future development and growth. So um, I, uh, I thought our staff was still working to try to determine uh, what we're going to do with this arc because uh, it's just not fair to people who live in the area, that's all. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Anoni in Morocco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three to the speaker. In regards to your arc, I'm assuming that SciTech would have done a hazard identification and risk assessment to determine how much how much distance you need within that arc. So once you do that highway, you have a legal responsibility to create the two mile radius. So when you say that you're not really open to negotiating that, is that because A, your hazard identification and risk assessment highlighted it, and B, because Graham Niagara agreed to it? It's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure I have the total answer to that. There has been risk assessment work done by SciTech. I'm not sure if Mr. Milo uh, wants to, to come up and, and speak a little more to that, because he's He's more aware of that issue than I am, but, but there has been work done in that regard. And has that work, the HIRA or your risk assessment, been provided to the city? Uh, Helen. There has been a lot of modeling done and risk assessments and as, well, as far as releases or any type of uh, um, you know, adverse conditions that it could take place at the plant. And the, the Eric was based on that science. Now that material, those, um, I can't remember, I can't recall if the entire reports, but I know that part of it has been provided. Um, and we've, there's been numerous discussions with city uh, staff about those reports. And this goes back a number of years. It goes back prior to the expansion, um, but it is, it is based on, on uh, modeling and, and risk assessments. And I ask that because very much like the Dorchester Road issue, I would rather you tell us bluntly, we have a legal liability for that two mile arc. It's not negotiable. It's for the safety of the residents so that we're not doing this back and forth all the time. Once you do, once you do a risk assessment, you have a legal liability to enforce that. So if that's the reason that's here, I would rather we know that than continue to think that there might be any wiggle room. We incidentally have our updated emergency management plan at the end of our document here. And I, I would rather know whether us extending that or trying to get you to diminish your arc would put residents at risk rather than think we could free up green space to put development to make tax dollars. I, I would rather put safety in front of money actually. Understood. Um, you know, we're not saying that there's there's no development with the yard, but it needs to be appropriate and compatible with the existing use of our facility, consistent with provincial policy. So it's it's more the sensitive uses in within that that buffer zone that we're, we are trying to maintain within the, the facility. And that's what you risk assessed was the sensitive uses. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Morocco. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a question, how many people does SciTech uh, employ? Come on back up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Currently, I believe it's around 150. Great. But I mean, there's a lot of spin-off uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the community as well and supporting of uh, yeah. auxiliary businesses as well. I don't know how many industries that we have, uh, industrial companies that we have in Niagara Falls that employ 150 that have the spin-off. I actually uh, did have the privilege of going up to SciTech and doing the tour when you had the expansion of government yes. funding there too. And uh, I'll tell you, they do have a very top-notch tight in security and how you deal with all your testing and that. It's always done and it was just far beyond uh, imagination, but it was extremely uh, interesting to see. I don't want to be responsible to chase away more industry. I've always wanted to support and work with SciTech and make sure that we try and make sure that we keep that industry here. There's not a lot of it, and I know that they have good paying jobs, and we'd like to bring more industry. So I think that we should be uh, good corporate citizens and try to work with you. And I actually support that too much. If this chemical company is telling us that there's this radius that they want us to stay away from, and they've been telling us for years and years. I've actually lived on Kayla Road, so we had a farm out there. I knew we were quite 
uh, aware of the chemical factory that was there all those years. And, you know, we, we actually lived with that. And we knew about development and where not to go as we kids to play there and not to go near there. But, uh, I mean, because it was, it was actually, more, it's more safer now than it ever was, I think, back, okay, I'm only 29, no, <laughs> um, 40 years ago. So anyway, um, I have to say that I think this is really important. These people are coming to us and telling us that there's a hazard to beware of. And I'm actually taking that a little bit further and going, okay, I'm not messing around with you guys. If you say there's that two mile radius, you don't need us to come near there, I'm all for it. And I think we have a due diligence after hearing this presentation from them, is that we better abide by it and maybe work with them as Councillor Iannone has actually said. You know what, let's not play around. Let's just say it's hands off, done. So thank you very much for sharing that. I truly appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. What are your sensitive uses? Really, it's focusing residential? on residential residential areas yeah. of assembly, things of that nature. Okay. You know, we, you know, um, things as, as other industry or commercial uh, uses that are compatible within the arc are are. Everybody uh, is interested in industry and jobs. Uh, certainly, no nobody any more than I am. Uh, and uh, I have a, still have a problem uh, that you should be able to look after your concerns within that plant, not r take other people's property away from them. I, I hear all of the other arguments. Uh, development uh, on uh, McLeod Road, the ARC comes in and cut, they want to develop it, but the ARC comes in and cuts out a quarter of their plant. Uh, their plan that they have. Uh, why don't you uh, buy all of that land and uh, solve the problem? You own the land. You know, if a new industry came in tomorrow and they wanted to say, well, this is a, uh, a dangerous uh, concern uh, for an accident, uh, so everybody around here uh, can't do anything with their property. Doesn't make any sense to me. Through you, your yeah. mayor, um, we're really not trying to take property away from anybody or saying that they can't d develop it. We're just looking for consistency in uh, in like uh, like development around the property, so that it's consistent with the usage. So that you know, if there is other industry, and there are areas around us that are zoned heavy industrial or industrial north of us to the east of us to the west of us and have that, that buffer zone of other like industry or commercial around us. We're not trying to restrict it in, in no development and leave it as vacant land. That's not the objective. Yes, Councilor Mark. So at the end, what they're basically saying is they'd like to have the same deal that was made uh, in, in previous with Grand Niagara, uh, but they don't hear <coughs> that that's on the table right now. So you just want to make sure that you have that same deal, the development goes through. Through you, your worship, to the councillor, the, your official plan has a policy that enshrines this arc. So we're just saying follow your official plan and, and maintain it. Okay. Well, of course there can be. Nothing's, nothing's forever. And we need to discuss that. And I agree. And I'll tell you, because now that I've heard the debate, uh, we've got uh, another business in the north end of the city, and they bought the land all around them. You know, and then there's no debate. They put it on title. You know, so that's the other option, rather than sterilizing all the land around you within two kilometers. That's the downside of it. The upside is their jobs. The downside is no one else can do anything with their land. They got to come to you and ask. And I appreciate that, but at the same time, you know, you can buy it, right? And then you can do what you want with it. Put a big fence two kilometers around. Okay, we're looking for the next speaker now. Sir, yeah, you've been waiting patiently. Please. Thank you. If you can state your name and your address. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening, Councillor. My name is Peter Wilk. I'm, uh, my address is 8107 Bigger Road. Could we just put this map up, please? Just so I can, uh, yes, this, this one would be great. Uh, I'm here to represent uh, my neighbor and friend, George Stewart, at 8365 Bigger Road. I'm that little rectangle in the blue hospital employment lands 
give me um, Yeah, right there, right by the DeGrassels. And my neighbor, George Stewart, is right there. That's correct. He owns 10 acres right there, two parcels. It was a 10 acre lot five years ago. He received permission to subdivide to a three acre lot with permission from city planning that he could build a home, a single home on private services as there's no uh, city services available. So under the proposed mixed plan designation, um, George, city planning has said that they will not allow a single home to be developed anymore on private services on the three acre lot. That's all we're talking about is that one three acre lot. And George has, has it approved already. And I'm just here to make a formal request that the proposed mixed use designation over the three acre lot at 8365 Bigger Road include an exception allowing it to be developed as a single family residence now and in the future, whether on private services or municipal services. Is there any questions? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tom Councilor Thompson. You want <laughs> no, go right ahead, that's all yours. No, yeah, I've uh, looked into this uh, myself as a result of the correspondence that came and uh, uh, my background with the health department uh, used to look at, uh, at land for septic tank systems and private water s systems. So you got a three acre lot out there uh, with the sophistication with respect to private sewage systems uh, and the improvements they've made over the years. Uh, we used to say had to be minimum of a, an acre, uh, two acres, uh, but a three acre lot there should be no reason why you should not be able to build a single family home. Uh, you also have a 10 acre parcel, does he not there? He has a seven acre parcel, seven. it was a 10 acre parcel, it's now seven acres that seven has a home. Three. It's the three acre that's vacant. He's allowed to do it today because it was granted by city planning. But if you approve the redesignation to mixed employment or mixed use land, City planning has said they're not going to allow Mr. Stewart to build a single family home on that three acre lot anymore on private services. And, and, and a lawyer, you know, we had a lawyer send a request to get it in writing and they said no. That's why we're here to ask for city council. Well, first of all, to approve uh, it. I, I think that's ridiculous. Was yeah, I'm going to get to Mr. Yeah. Ilovich to maybe weigh in on that. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, this Mr. Wilk is not 100% accurate. Yes, we did have a letter from Rocky Vacca on behalf of Mr. Stewart. Uh, we did send Mr. Vacca a letter uh, stating that, of course, uh, Mr. Stewart can build his single family house on the three acre lot with private services. That's exactly what he has. Uh, we also outlined that uh, there were other opportunities for him so that should he wish to develop in the future uh, a more intensive land form, such as mixed use, he would have greater opportunity than just a single family house. But there's nothing in the current planning regime that would prevent him from doing that. Not, not uh, currently today, but when you change it to mixed use, and this is the correspondence right from you, uh, John Barnsley, who I believe reports to you. Yeah, yes, I, I and, read that and I read And Mr. he said Vaca's he would provide this to in City Council. Well, the response clearly says here, while not permitting single detached dwellings, yes. Mr. Stewart will enjoy significant development opportunities afforded by mixed use designation. And we replied in writing saying, well, there's no services today. There may not be any city services 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So we want, we're formally requesting and in fact, I have, no problem, I have no problem with meeting with um, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Vaca, and whomever, if they would wish to have their property identified as single family, 
These are just colors on a map. Well, it can be, um, an, if, it, if we get an exception for Mr. Stewart, it could stay mixed use. Like, believe me, if sewers find their way out there or city services, and there's a demand to do something with that land, it will develop into higher density mixed use down the road. Why don't we just, do this? Because well, no decisions are going to be made tonight. Okay. So why don't we, he's agreed to meet with uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, Mr. Vaca. Yes. And if you can coordinate that meeting, we'll get that. Because tonight, no decision. This is just for. We just wanted to make it aware, like right now, because the next time city planning no, comes here they could say we want you to approve this and we don't want to have to come here with a lawyer and say Thanks, mr wilk i appreciate yeah. you doing that I do. okay thank yeah. you yeah Council. well wait a minute i haven't finished yet okay <laughs> I, I, I didn't agree to that I, I think we should give them assurance that they can build on that property regardless of what they do and if they want to make a change to mixed use in the future you come here and go through a zoning application and do that What's the matter with that? That's the process that we have here. So uh, I'd make a motion that uh, they give the approval to build well, that. We're at right in the middle home. of a public meeting, so maybe we can deal with this after the public meeting. Okay, we're right in the middle of it right now, so we can deal with this a little yeah. bit later. So we, if you want to hang tight, we can address a motion. Yeah. We'll we're make just sure asking for an exception that even if it's designated mixed use, that he can still build a single home on private or well, pub I'm make public services. Yeah. No, fair enough. No, it's reasonable. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to speak to Kate? Yep, you can step forward. If you can state your name and your address, please. My name is Rose Aurora, and I live at 8264 Grassy Brook Road, right at the mouth of the entrance to the Grand Niagara Golf Course. Okay. Um, I sit on three and a half acres, and it's kind of plop right in the middle of this development. <coughs> So I'm looking to understand how this is going to impact my life. Uh, where is your, uh, can you say specifically where you are? That square, the, right there. Right there. So uh, Mr. Hilovich, uh, is there any um, feedback on Ms. Aurora's property? Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. so Ms. Aurora's property is here in yellow which is basically single family housing. She has three acres, she probably has the potential to uh, subdivide that if she wishes in the future should these policies come to fruition. Otherwise she would have a three acre single family lot just the way she enjoys it today. Would it be exactly what I enjoy today? Today I have, my designated zoning is open space. Would I have that same those same privileges I once all this is done. I don't know what you mean by open space and privileges. Well, my zoning right now is open space. So what can you do with your open space zone? Well, you tell me. Well, <laughs> well okay, open space means recreational uses, Your Worship. Um, I understood she lived there, but I do live there. I do live there. So do you wish to develop it for recreational uses? Is open space the only thing that recreational is well, for? Well, you just told me it's open space. That's what my designation, that's what my zoning, is. I, did, I didn't make the designation. Okay. I'm okay. just telling so, you what I have. All right, so I'm not sure what the speaker wishes. At the, as I stated, she can enjoy three acres with her single family house. The yellow that's on there shows single family house. If she wishes to have a business, then we would have to identify it as a different color. You know, I don't know what she wants. Did you have a specific desire for your property? Did you want to do something to it? No, but um, I'm just a layman. I, I don't know all these terms, okay? So you should be able to tell me what open space designates, and it's not just recreational. What, because well, otherwise, all the homes that are there wouldn't be rec wouldn't be open space. Well, I think all of the houses that are there pre-exist the golf course. Um, the there are special provisions that recognize those houses on those lots. Um, but open space means just exactly what it means. 
means recreational uses. So it could be a golf course, which is what the adjacent lands are. It could be tennis courts. It could be a soccer field. Um, it could be you know, a driving range. Um, I, could have, op I could also have farm animals there. No, open space isn't farmland. Mm. Uh, you can, you can farm have land. you can have animals on open space. Um, as well, far as I understand. you would have to comply with the city's animal control bylaw. Um, but okay, uh, so you're telling me that if this goes through, what's designate what would be designated would be single family residential, and I would have the opportunity to develop that land. Yes. Councillor Thompson, did you want to weigh in too? You had a comment? Thank you, Mr. No, Lynch. I was just going to say, if you've got three and a half acres out there, you have your home there, if there are services come by, you can come in and put an application in for whatever you want. Uh, if you want to develop it, if you want to do anything, you come in and bring an application before the council and, uh, and we deal with it. The same okay. as we are here tonight. So now, the, the same thing that we were talking about, the other, the other um, development on Oldfield Road, the timeline for this is 10 to 20 years. Now, because I'm the only one sitting right in the middle of this, I'm gonna get all the traffic, all the noise, all the dust, all the dirt, and I'll be the only one being able to complain. Who's gonna listen to one person? You're not going to get 20 people calling you to tell you that, but I have to live there. So 10 to 20 free... years is a long time for yeah, this I... project to be going on. Yeah. Well, 10 to 20 years, no, nobody knows how it's going to advance. So, yeah. And if it does advance, we're not making a decision. On oh, that I understand tonight. that, yeah. but I just yeah. want to know how it yeah. Im impacts yeah. me if it does go through for 10 to 20 yeah. years. Who wants to who wants to live in a construction zone for 10 to 20 years? Yeah. Well, definitely yeah. the downside, right? There's the upside and the downside. Exactly. The downside. Exactly. Yeah. I'm and just I just want to I only want to clarify the, what what it means for me. I'm not going to lie. I, yeah. You know the other and stuff. The other side, if the other stuff matters to me. There, I'm sorry. Uh, I already have services. Thank you. What municipal services? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, you got a valuable piece of property. All right. Do you have, did you have any other questions or anything? No, no. again, no decisions are made. No, I understand that. I understand that. I just needed to know what. And how you can it at any time me. come in and sit with our planners, and they can help you look at the options uh, if things go forward. I mean, at any time you can come in and sit with them as well. Okay. Councilor Anthony. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is you do not want to live like the residents on Dorchester Road for the next 10 to 20 years. Because I don't have 30 voices to, to complain about. Got it. And so you are now myself. on the record. That's right. the point of today's yeah. meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, yes, you can step up. If you can state your name and your address. Hi, my name is uh, Ravinder Singh, and I own a property on 8675 Montrose Road. And uh, I might be in the minority, but I think this development is a good, a good thing. I think that, unfortunately, like I feel for all my citizens here, but the noise and the dirt and everything else, but this is the cost of progress. And I think somebody should speak for to a positive thing. And I think in order for any city to grow, we have to deal with these things. And unfortunately, it sucks, but that's what we need to grow. And I just want to be the one voice to say, I'm for this. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Singh. Yes, um, next. Yep, step up to the mic. If you can state your name and your address, please. Uh, Linda Manson, 4732 Cookman Crescent, Niagara Falls. There actually was one voice up here earlier who was trying to convey something of a positive nature, and that was uh, Dr. Barker. I was, if, if staff, if the, uh, I'm sorry, if council had read, or has read uh, his presentation, he opens it by saying that he was very enthusiastic about this project um, about a year and a half ago. And uh, I think the reason why his voice was getting elevated uh, has to do with the term bait and switch. It was a bit of a bait and switch. 
I was one of the, he mentions in there, there were about 20 people that showed up last, last uh, winter. We think this is, you know, was, looked like a, a reasonable thing. It was, it was put off like in, in Never Neverland out there. Uh, someday, if the hospital's ever approved, someday, it's out there. Uh, so we were like, you know, this, you know, and, and actually with, with counts, with the planning department, it was such a refreshing change from another development. Um, and we thought, well, okay, so the people are, are, are looking at things and they're listening and, uh, and then, and, and there were two disturbing things, if I recall, John, two disturbing things. And one was the sort of the absence of a, a little bit of, of, of a natural heritage thing, which John, through his due diligence, went out and, dis and discovered there was even more. The other thing was the term compensation. Last year it was offsetting. This year it's compensation. And we asked, and oh well, you know, it's just, it's just, we just use the terms. You can't compensate for some of these things. And, and, and you know, while this may be a wonderful development, there are a couple things. And and, and Councillor Morocco said two things. She said, well, so is this not going to be a still a golf course? Council is being kept in the dark on this thing, like a dark ages, unless you actually go out to these, to these open houses, and, and Lord knows you've got an, a lot of work to do. And to grow to these things and see, no, that's, and, and, you, and to get there, you had to grow out into the dark, and it was a beautiful evening, and it was, it was so secluded, and all the animal, there were noises, even in the middle of the winter time, and, and there was silence. You know, that's all going to change. That's fine. The thing, I, I can't remember, I think it was year 2000 when this, when this was made into a golf course. Yes. What was that? The environmental impact studies in 2000, 17 years ago, are very different. And when John Barker, when Dr. Barker mentioned, when his voice went up and mine started to grow up too because of a certain thing, a peer review of, a, of another development, when God created this particular area, it was before the QEW, it was before the Hydro Canal, it was, there was one big giant land mass there. And when council keeps getting presented with piecemeal developments, tonight, before this, it was the old field road, this section. Before that, it was, that was section three, section two, section one. Then you got to the other side of Drummond Road. Now they're looking to the south side of, you know, uh, you know of Thundering Waters development. The peer review that came in on the environmental impact study of Thundering Waters Forest has everything to do with this development. Everything. All of the recommendations, and they are mighty. They are mighty. All of the recommendations are forward directed. Council has to, when it comes time, make a decision of what you want your legacy to be. Because there was a time when this was one big piece of land, then it became this. Not your fault, people buy things, but down the road. Yes, golf courses are going to be turned into developments because golf is going out of fashion. Because we're getting older. The ones with, and people with the money don't want to golf anymore. They're off doing something else. They're <laughs> buying condos on boats. <laughs> you know. But I'm just saying, these things, you can't, you can't just be a piecemeal thing here, a piecemeal thing there. That thing there, the animals who now, I was reading an article today and they're talking about we are now into the sixth genocide of animals, the sixth one. This is the first one that's being created by people. And there's another side of this thing too. And I would like to point this out. Dr. Barker said, we're only talking 11 hectares, we're talking 5% of the entire de de development. I've seen this man stand here, and he's like a, he's like a, he's an asset to this community. He's a, he's a, he's a natural resource. I hope you read his, his report. When he's not saying he's against this, he's saying with some modifications, you could have set this up as the best scenario given what happened. It should never have been approved as a golf course when it was because of where it was but it became one. Can't take that back. You do have opportunities along the way to take other things, to prevent things from happening in the future. And when someone goes out there and, 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 and uh, 
and takes, does the due diligence of doing the research and finds out that things were missing and finds out that things weren't presented. And, find, and that's not his job, but it is because he cares. And there are a lot of people in this town who care. And when you are presented with something, you need to have every fact and you need to have it well ahead of time. This thing, 2015, and it's been in the works. And who knows how long before that, because rumor was out, and rumors are out now about other golf courses. Okay? Be prepared, be forearmed. Think about the legacy. Don't think of this in one little thing. Those poor beasties who were being endangered in that area there, they used to have the whole thing. Then we put a highway through, we put a canal through, we put roads through. We got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, I remember I was one of the people that put in and said, oh, that center thing there, you know, like, make it contiguous here. Okay, now they're going to make it contiguous, but I'm finding out at the expense of something else. Please think bigger. Ask questions. Demand of the staff. And they've got a tough job, too, because all of this growth at what expense? At what legacy? This may be one of the better ones. And I think, in, in like that gentleman said, one positive note. You had a positive voice here. But it's, it's he gave, he's trying to come up with the best possible alternatives. Please don't let those things just fall on an editing floor. Okay? So it's, it's in your notes, it's there. Good luck. Thank you, Ms. Manson. Yes, Councillor? Thank you. Ms. Manson, I have to agree with you. I think the Thundering Waters peer review has a ton to do with this development. And, and I think the fact that we're still dealing with both, we have to look at both hand in hand. But I want to ask a question in regards to, I had written down where Mr. Bacher had said that, oh, that if we followed his recommendations, only 5% of the development would not be able to be included <coughs> in this official amendment. Am I understanding that correctly? Can I go through you to Mr. Balker? Did I understand that correctly, Mr. Balker? Um, yes, it, it, it's very small. The, the indicated 11.4 hectares, and the only other area would be to correct, extend a, uh, to stop the fragmentation of the, uh, of the uh, PSW to have a connecting corridor to the Welland River, half of which would be along an existing hedge hedge road that's in, identified in the you know background studies. Okay, thank you. I don't okay. think it's negative to want to have green space. I don't think it's negative to think in the long game where I want my granddaughter to be able to go out there and, and see green space or go out there and go through a, go a hike. I don't think it's bad to have green space for anybody. At this point, if we keep developing the way we are, we're not going to have any green space in this city, period. And I know you have to balance money, nature, environment, but at this point in time, everything that's, every, uh, global warming, every environmental aspect, everything tells us to stop doing that. So I thank you for your comments. Again, those are going to be included in this, and I will definitely keep in mind your 11.4 hectares in, and keeping the Thundering Waters peer review in mind. Okay, do we have anyone else here other than the applicant? Yes, would you like to step forward, state your name and your address? My name is uh, John Armstrong. I live at 4223 Lincoln Avenue in beautiful Beamsville, Ontario. <laughs> And uh, I'm here today, I'm not actually here today to talk about uh, offsets and I'm not here to talk about uh, industrial buffers today. Uh, uh, but I am uh, here to talk about the generations to come piece because I'm here today uh, representing uh, the province's masonry industry. And uh, it's an association, a provincial association that represents the province's brick block and stone industry. And uh, our members are manufacturers, they're suppliers and contractors and people who dedicate their lives to building strong, resili resilient, uh, sustainable, and beautiful communities, neighborhoods, and buildings. Across Ontario, the masonry sector employs more than 14,000 people and contributes $1.3 billion to the provincial economy. Uh, part of what we do uh, at Masonry Works is we work with municipalities to help them make the most of their planning policies 
uh, to build their communities to a higher standard. We visit municipalities uh, that are undertaking official plan reviews and large secondary plans, and we make the case for building to that higher standard. Uh, in the past uh, three years, we've been to about uh, 50 municipalities on Ontario, so we've actually been, we've been all over the place. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific project. Uh, we, we want to, uh, we want to uh, help communities like Niagara Falls build those beautiful, resilient neighborhoods and buildings, the kind of buildings that people will be living in, and they're going to be talking about uh, 100 years from now, um, because that's, uh, that's really what you're doing, right? You're making 100-year you're making decisions right now. So, so uh, we're here to, to ask you to pay attention to the built form. Uh, we're talking a lot about land use. We're here to talk about the, we're here to talk about the building and the buildings. Uh, we call our program Building Tomorrow's Heritage Neighborhoods Today uh, because, again, that's what you're doing. You're building tomorrow's heritage neighborhoods today. So we're asking you to pay, to pay attention to the built form when you go forward. Uh, it's my understanding that, that uh, Appendix A of the plan uh, will include the urban design guidelines uh, with, a, with an architectural component. Uh, the version that we were able to see uh, on the city's website, however, didn't, uh, didn't include that appendix, so we're uh, assuming that you're, that, uh, you're still working on it and, and its completion hasn't quite yet been finalized, but that's, uh, th that's where, where our remarks sit today. Um, because regardless of having strong urban design guidelines uh, in the plan, it's absolutely vital that, that, uh, to, to not just complete the plan, but it's vital, it's vital to your complete community's idea that, uh, that you have strong urban design guidelines. Particularly because you've got you've got a riverfront neighborhood, you've got the new South Niagara Hospital being built nearby. It's a neighborhood that's going to have strong potential for a signature neighborhood in Niagara Falls uh, for the future. And this is an area where a lot of people are going to naturally want to live and to work. It's an ideal example of a neighborhood that really should be considered to be a future heritage neighborhood with that high standard of built form. In fact, I actually encourage those high standards and all of the new developments because of the, the, because of the, the importance of, of, the, of the generations to come. Uh, municipalities are increasingly understanding how important it is to build those kinds of neighborhoods that residents want to live in. Through strong policy, design policy, you have the power to make that happen. Through the Planning Act, you can, uh, you can as, a, as a city, exercise very broad input uh, into matters of exterior design. Uh, including character, scale, appearance, design features, sustainable design, and building materials. Many municipalities are using these tools, such as site plan control and architectural control guidelines, to have input into the built form, even in townhouses and in small residential. We understand that one of the principles of this plan, uh, of your plan, is to promote placemaking, and, uh, and, and that the intent is for the secondary plan area to develop into a complete community with distinctive livable uh, neighborhoods. Part of what makes a neighborhood distinctive is the actual built form, as I said, of the homes and the buildings within it. It's more than just how the houses are positioned. It's what you see and what you, do and, and, uh, and what you drive by. People notice the building materials. And, those, uh, and, and, and they add an incredible quality to that neighborhood, especially when you look and imagine those neighborhoods 50, 70, uh, 75, or 100 years into the future. Uh, the plan already has some policies set forth, uh, set out uh, uh, for elements such as orienting develop the development to a road, for instance, and that's a good start, but it's vital that the plan deliver fully on those still to come urban design guidelines. I'm going to rise to a point of order. I can see everybody around this room agrees with me. This has got nothing to do with what we're dealing with at this point. Well, Mr. Armstrong, uh, did you want to just maybe summarize, uh, you know? Uh, sure, sure, I'll summarize. Yeah, absolutely, I'll summarize. Yeah, I'll summarize. Please, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, basically, the basically the point is, you're creating a large, you're creating a large new community, large new area. Uh, you're you're looking at the the planning pieces. A component of that in your appendix is 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 the uh, are the urban design guidelines, the architectural design, uh, the architectural controls. We're basically saying, pay attention to the pay attention to the built form. Densities are getting tighter. Communities are getting are getting smaller. That built form is getting thank more you, getting more and more important. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, for Mr. Armstrong? Okay. 
Okay. No, thank you very much. Thanks Appreciate very much. That. Thank you. Is there anyone else here other than, actually, is anyone else that wants to speak? Yes, Ms. Grandoni, if you want to come forward. Yes, Councilor. Can I just ask a question in regards to his presentation? Yes. Basically, he's a lobbyist for the bricklayers. Yeah. Is that who we now have put on our agendas? Anyone that wants to speak can speak. Just, just want to make sure, because that re Councilor Campbell had it hit the nail right on the head. That has nothing to do with what we're dealing about here. So, we're, so we could now have lobbyists come and talk to us about our developments? Anyone can speak, Councilor. All right. Everybody's lobbying some position. Yeah, come forward, please, Ms. Grandoni. I'm going to hold you to that. Anyone can speak because uh, years ago, oh, well, I, I, I've been denied the right to speak in here sometimes. So I don't recall you ever being denied, Ms. Grandoni. Uh, I'm sorry, but I sure remember. But I hate to start off like that. Um, but I was hard to resist. I have a signed copy here that I'd like to leave with the clerk, if, if you could please pass it. Thank you. And did the council all get this through email or through the clerk? Mr. Chairman, members of council, my first subheading is dominant ecosystem ignored. <clears throat> The dominant ecosystem here is the Welland River. Prior to any development approvals, either north or south, south of this major ecosystem, a Welland River watershed plan should be undertaken, completed, and adopted into the official plans of both the city and the region. This would be following your own regional policy plan and the provincial policy statement. Such a plan should legislate all forests, streams, floodlines, and well water recharge areas to be protected, there being essential to this river's ecosystem health. Further, public access either by roads or trails and wildlife access provided by wildlife corridors must be ensured. In this case, access roads should be added along the river to include the industrial lands between the Grand Niagara lands and Montrose Road. To deviate from the watershed approach will result in a confused piecemeal river plan, leaving all ecosystems shortchanged and unbalanced and the public dissatisfied. And the Northwest area is a classic example. Opportunity for use of the river and its increasingly rare forest as a tourist attraction will be lost. My next subheading is failure to do hydrogeological study. Again, considering the proximity of the Grand Niagara development to this major Welland River ecosystem, it is inexcusable that the foremost hydrogeological study has not been done as part of the environmental impact study for, for the Grand Niagara development. This means the EIS is incomplete and should not be accepted. Hydrogeological studies were done as far back as 1976 for Shriners Creek. So why not 40 years later when so much evidence exists proving the need for such a study? Such evidence includes sewer infiltration, sinking sewers, basement flooding, sinking roads, sinking workers, lives near lost, sinking houses in some areas where I don't dare mention. These problems have become the taxpayer's burden while the developer profits. Remember the Chippewa area proximate to the Welland River still has uncorrected sewer issues after 40 years. Such a major omission means that impacts on recharge areas nearby and possibly distant farm wells, provincially significant wetland forests and stream-based flow including springs and accompanying impact on fisheries remain unknown and therefore unprotected. Groundwater features are required to be protected by the provincial policy statement. Under stormwater management, the next uh, heading, I could not readily see, and I stand corrected if it's in there, in the environment documents any proposed location for storm ponds. Past experience has found attempts to locate these in PSW forests in an, an undesirable place. 
Their location should be made, in, made known in time for public comment. The next title, Reducing Infrastructure Costs and Development Charges. Presently, there is much controversy centered around obtaining development charges from developers. One accounting rule is, this, is that if you cannot increase your income, for example, through development charges, then look at decreasing your costs. Managing subdivision rainwater runoff all over land without pipes would be one way of greatly reducing new infrastructure costs, reducing cost of sewer problems, and reducing sewer replacement costs. And that's not impossible to do because I know for a fact it's been done in some areas in Ontario. Going green gets you out of the red. Regional reports have espoused such an approach. It would take a motion from council to initiate such a change. These Welland River developments would be a good place to start once a Welland River watershed is, plan is in place. Protect existing forests. More of the forests bounded by QEW, Lions Creek Road, Montrose Road, and the Rexinger Road should be protected. And it's some distance from this gentleman's uh, project. It's the furthest right at the bottom on, on that map there in blue, I believe. This forest extended to Montrose Road and clear cutting has occurred for years. Dumping occurred in a pin oak wetland area here that should be restored by removal of fill. This particular owner has done enough harm and should not be allowed to cut any more. I remain opposed to any more forest removal in an area that has already lost more than 100 acres of forest to the existing golf course and proposed hospital. That's kind of sickening that they destroy a beautiful forest to put a hospital on it. I have some questions there, and I would remind Council that it has the power to request a Welland River watershed plan. And I've left you a quote, if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. Heard that in a service uh, on Sunday. But uh, there's been a lot of talk about leaving green space, not just green space, but something uh, it, it, it's, it's important also for bees, our, our pollinators. It's becoming a serious situation. I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you have anyone else that wants to address council? Yes? You can state your name and your address. Tikakeros in the young gats, Wagaskliwaga, and Yuagi Tiloto, and Yati Aganahi, Hawatsadani. Um, it might be easier to write down Carl Dockstater at 5113 Wilmot Street, Niagara Falls. Um, there's a couple, it's, it's been a long meeting, so I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and get to the point. Um, when, I look, when I look at this corridor and when I look at these maps, I've looked at them on Google Maps and I've gone out there and, and I've driven around the area uh, I've definitely spent some time in this corridor that's attached to the Well and River uh, and that's attached to the Thundering Waters project that, that's been the subject of, I would say, much controversy um, in, in this council room. Um, but to, to take it back to the Grand Niagara, um, whether you call it compensation, whether you call it biodiversity offsetting, what, what you can't call it is, is a good plan. You, you just can't recreate the natural features that are present. When you look at these maps, even, even, in, the, uh, even in the colors that are used here, you can see that that's all, that's all high quality forest that's lining the waterway. When you think of the points that, that Jean just made and, and you talk about what she was looking at, the fact, that, the fact that you could ignore the dominant ecosystem feature and not even consider what's happening with, with the Welland River, what are we going to do without water? Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to development at all. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for, for the gentleman with the, with the great ringtone in the back of, about his, his advocating for, for the cost of progress, right? But we really do have to look at what's the cost of this progress. Right now it looks like there's going to be a hospital built and that's gonna be across the street from this development that's gonna be all built up. There's a proposal to, to take down around half 
of the Thundering Waters Forest Area and build all of that up and then interconnect everything. So we'll need more, more water runoff, we'll need more sewage treatment, we'll need more roads built, we'll have more trucks coming in, thundering around. I mean, maybe we'll give a new, a new meaning from, from Thundering Waters. Maybe we can call it Thundering Roads, right, from, from all of the transportation infrastructure that, that will be needed in, in the area. Um, the, though specifically, uh, since the point of this is to register comments, I would like to inquire, um, in September 21st, the Haudenosaunee Development Institute, um, referencing their file number of 0302002001700005, they wrote a letter that was in regards to the Thundering Waters development, but in the last paragraph of the letter, they did ask for information on, on the Grand Niagara secondary plan. When they asked for information on the Grand Niagara Secondary Plan, it was in a letter that, that also very specifically referenced the Nanfan Treaty of 1701. It referenced the Mitchell Map of 1755. It referenced the August Treaty of Niagara 1764. There were two treaty, uh, treaties of Niagara in 1764. There was also a 1781 Treaty of Niagara that, that doesn't apply to this particular parcel of land. Uh, and they referenced the Treaty of Fort Stanwix of, of 1768. So before this is to proceed, I, I would definitely like to, to see that letter addressed. Um, I'd like to understand how communication with the Métis Nation of Ontario, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council was conducted. There also seems to be an inherent uh, conflict in the way that the upper tier and lower tier municipality do their business in that it's the upper tier of government that's tasked with consulting with First Nations groups, but generally the idea is that the lower tier does the secondary planning and the legwork. So there appears to be no mechanism in the lower tier for a proper consultation process. So this is something that should actually be factored into to all secondary planning that, that comes in to ensure that treaty rights aren't, aren't being infringed upon. So until that's addressed, I, I definitely have, have great concerns about this. Um, though again, I'd like to clarify that, that I'm not blanket against the development. Um, I also am concerned about changing this from a golf course to all of the different proposed employment lands and the 3,800 jobs. And I'd be curious to know if that's 3,800 jobs or if that's something that can actually be measured in, in labor hours, right? Like are these, are these permanent full-time jobs that are gonna be created for people that are going to be able to contribute to the, to the community or is there going to be a quick, a quick boom, perhaps some outsourcing of labor brought in to, to build up all this stuff and then, and then those jobs are all gone after a certain amount of time. They're, they'll be gone, the forest will be gone, all of the natural heritage features will be gone. Um, so I did, I did summarize all the, all the concerns that I've been hearing, uh, and I want to try and get to, to an end here. So, um, there are about 10 points that, that were made that I thought were important. So the, the dominant ecosystems, uh, hydrological networks being ignored, that, that is a concern of mine that I would like to have addressed. Um, the treaty agreements, uh, haven't been brought up. They aren't brought up. Um, it, uh, 27 years ago, unfortunately, the Oka crisis happened in Quebec um, as a result of just the presumption that I guess that the, the relations with the first people of this land is, is unimportant. Um, the Anthropocene was brought up tonight. I think that's actually um, important, right? The, uh, the cost of progress, and when we're talking about a great city for, for generations to come, I'm specifically concerned with the seven generations and, and how not having any sort of a longer term environmental plan, how not having sustainable development, how, how not factoring in uh, the environment. I, I wanna know how that's going to affect the Anthropocene specifically, I'll be following up on that. Um, Again, I just want to reiterate the compensation, biodiversity offsetting, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's a bad idea uh, and that that should not be included as part of this plan. Um, I want to note that even SciTech is worried about this plan. Um, I want to note that this development is all proposed very close to PSWs and if you, if you go along the existing PSWs in Oldfield Road right now, you will find debris, you'll find garbage, you'll find things and, and I'm not saying that, the, you know, I'm not faulting the workers, I understand they're busy and they, they have timelines and everything but, but we could all go right now and we could have a look at, at all of the garbage that's, that's on the side of the road, right? So the, this is the type of thing that happens when you build right next to PSWs. You compromise the integrity of the PSWs and I, I want my grandkids, grandkids to have PSWs more than I want them to, to have some developments. 
Um, the old growth not being on the map, that, that concerns me. I mean, I'm going to walk away from this meeting with that image of, of John Bacher hugging a tree that isn't even in one of these protected areas. <laughs> like that's, that's very, very concerning. Um, so I'd, I'd ask to have that concern specifically addressed. Um, I'd like to ask about how the plan for development uh, seems to be accelerating at an exponential rate forever. Like that, that's just something that it's sort of a recurring thing. I understand that we need places to live. I understand that it's a good thing that the economy is growing. But like, what is Niagara Falls doing? Is Niagara Falls always going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow forever? Because we're sort of on the same pace that we've been on for the last 100 years. And if we keep that pace for the next hundred years, then there's there's not going to be anything left for anybody. There's not there's not going to be water, there's not going to be land, there's not going to be any natural features. Um, I would like to note that, that we need water more than we need new houses. And this this is right up on the Welland Canal. Uh, this this is an important an important source of water. Um, and that uh, I, I actually I actually agree with with Mr. Armstrong that that if it is going to be built, it should be built to, to the highest quality, right? That that if there's going to be new buildings put up in, in this city that I love, the city that I've lived all over Ontario, and I've said this to this council before, but I've chose to live in Niagara Falls because I think it has great natural features. I think it has a great park system. I think I think it has great people working hard to represent the city's best interests and my kids' best interests and their future kids' best interests. Uh, but if, if things are going to be built, I, I just want to see that those things are being built to, to the highest standard. So I'd really like to press Mr. Hurlovich to, if, if he's going to go ahead with this, go ahead in the, in the best possible way and be mindful that this is built properly. Thank you very much for, for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Dockstader. Any questions uh, of council? Okay, thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? All right. The public meeting with respect to the proposed secondary sorry, plan. Sorry, I'm sorry, yep. Oh, yep, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, did you want to speak? Sure, just make a couple of words. Yeah, absolutely. Come forward. It's been a long night, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I keep it really short. Mayor and councillors, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm Frank Baldessera. I represent the uh, ownership of uh, Grand Niagara. And I can tell you, I'm first, well, I'm sure I'm glad that I don't own thundering waters. I mean, I can't believe the amount of conversations that are around thundering waters. Just a couple of simple points. Uh, I just want to kind of put things in perspective, hopefully. Uh, this land was assembled well over 20 years ago. You know well that uh, the previous uh, owners in the height of the golf industry decided to build a, a quite an important golf course with uh, a golf uh, resort component to it. The city, in its wisdom, and the region supported it with significant funds. And um, and we, and then, 19, and then 2009 happened. 2009 was a traumatic experience for people in the building industry and the development industry, and for a lot of people. And we got involved in property in 2010. So we're not newcomers to this. 2010, we got involved. And with my partners, the Portland Holding Group and the Western Group of Companies, we purchased the land in 2011. <clears throat> in 2000, right after we purchased it, we brought together and we had a competition with three prominent consulting firms to try to find out what were the best uses of the land. And I could tell you, we spared no expense to try to find a way to make it a golf resort component, a wellness component. We did a lot of effort in trying to take that original vision and make it happen. But the economic times just didn't allow for that to happen. We then got excited uh, when, of course, Jim and his enthusiasm about the hospital and the city tried to bring a hospital to, to the South Niagara area. We were helpful, I believe, in getting the Grassel family to help with that and, uh, and, and did do the initial um, investment in that. Um, we selected our consulting group in 2014, and as said, uh, in 2015, we had a meeting with 24 attendees uh, from the region, Conservation Authority, and from the city, and our team to talk about how to come up with a secondary plan that met everyone's needs. We did a lot of listening. We heard a lot of reasons and what your priorities were and what the city's and the region's priorities were. <coughs> and we believe we've reflected that <coughs> in our plans. <coughs> Excuse me. We do have a major asset on this property, and that is our environmental spaces. We are very sensitive to uh, protecting the ESAs, protecting the corridors, making sure that the whole well and river area is protected. And you can tell, if you look into the fabric of our development, that we have done 
a pretty good job and obviously there's always room for improvement to be able to really do what is required there. With respect to SciTech, I hadn't planned on speaking on it uh, today, but in listening to the comments by councillors and by others, two words came out, consistency and safety, consistency and safety. And I can tell you that our position is very simple. We believe that SciTech should have a single arc, which is consistent for every landowner, which is consistent for every uh, person, and knows what can and can't be done both inside that arc and outside that arc. And presently, we have a separate arc, again, previously negotiated in good faith, that is not consistent with the current arc. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to sit down and talk about the merits of it, because I truly believe that it's in the city's best interest, in the region's best interest, obviously in our interest, and also in SciTech's best interest, to have one single arc that everyone works from. We also I have a working group that we worked with for almost two years, and that working group has been intimately involved in setting up all the parameters for our studies and is in the process of reviewing all the studies, and hopefully they'll come up with recommendations shortly for you. And I can tell you, having worked on several major developments uh, throughout the, the Greater Toronto area in particular, that there hasn't been a more cooperative, more open, more transparent process We've had three public meetings. This is the fourth meeting that we had where the public's been involved. We have attempted to communicate and educate everyone and have everyone input their comments and their opinions into our plan. This has not been something that's hurried. It's not something that's been fast and we've been able to take all that advice and take that and reflect that in these plans. The plans, are, I think, are really well founded. So just in closing, it has been a pleasure working with the city staff, Alex's group, in particular John Barnsley, Reno's group at the region, uh, headed up by Brittany Williamson and Dave DeLise and, and his, his team at the Conservation Authority, because they have put in, had a lot of input into what we're doing, how we're doing it, and make sure that everyone's interests are, are, are taken care of. And this, in my opinion, should be a model example of how the private sector and the public sector can actually work together to get something very significant done. We are excited about getting this development going as soon as possible. We're excited about bringing all these jobs, and we're excited about having a mixed um, um, residential uses that have that really get all of the different mm. constituency involved. We we have heard very clearly that building another retirement community, a golf course community, is not in the best interest of the region, and we heard that very clearly from from you. So thank you very much for your time. I know this has been a long night and really appreciate working with the city, the region, and everyone here to make this great project really a reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? I'm sorry, we might have some questions. Yes, Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a very good presentation. You've got a great golf course. It is. It is one I, of the best I, golf courses. I always say it's one of the best kept secrets. Um, Mr. Bachner, he positive about your development, and he had indicated he had a couple suggestions. I'm just simply asking you: Did you did you have a chance to look at those? Did you have any comments? Well, again, I, I'm, I told you very clearly, and you can take a look at our plans. We are very sensitive. I believe that it's a major asset for our did development. You look at his proposal? Well, again, I haven't seen okay, what he's yes. done, but I believe that we have a major asset in the environmentally protected ESAs. We have major assets with the Welland River. We have major assets, in the, and we want to protect those assets. And we have gone to extreme lengths of providing, if you look at the, our road patterns, we don't try to use road patterns that infringe. We want is public access to all of the green areas. What we want is walking trails. We want people to be able to enjoy this incredible site and make this community the premier community for Niagara Falls. There's no question in our mind. That is an asset. We're not trying to eliminate or cut down big trees. That's not what our plans are. I'm um, through you, I'll, just, I'll close with this. You take a look at it. I will. And have a discussion Absolutely. And see what his thoughts are. That was it. And again, I just want to remind him, though, we are not thundering waters, and we're not doing what they are doing. So whatever that is, I just don't know. Well, <laughs> I had that feeling when you said, "I'm glad we don't own thundering waters." I thought there had to be a little more to it. Listen, th thank you very much. Thank you. And I, by the way, it's my pleasure to finally meet all of you. I know I've met a few of you, and uh, I trust that uh, we'll have many years of being able to work together in a very positive way. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Baldessera. Okay, there are no more speakers. The public meeting with respect to the proposed secondary plan is now concluded.
Uh, we've got two recommendations. One, that we accept all of the input we received tonight. And secondly, that staff continue with reviewing and bringing the second secondary plan forward to council for a decision at a later date. So I'm looking for that motion. Moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Iannone. There's no further discussion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody that came out tonight. Thank you. Okay, round to the consent agenda. What's the will of council? Okay, motion to move the consent agenda. Look seconded by Councilor Strange. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Um, I've got to run through my notes here quickly. Sorry, I apologize in advance. We get the lights on, the lights on there. Um, we're li live streaming, uh, everybody. So just a reminder, it's been noted, we've had some people call in that they pick up on cell phones and they pick up on ambient noise. Uh, for the record, live streaming, we've had 4,500 views since we started live streaming. That's been more than 1,000 hours viewed. 60% is live. 40% seems to be, I'm sorry, 60% is uh, on demand versus 40% where they're, wait a minute, I got this confused here. Help me out, Mr. KJ. On demand viewing is has 61% versus, oh yeah, okay. 60% they view after the fact and 40% live. Typical council meeting, we've got six to 700 viewers. And the part that I was quite surprised how many countries are viewing our council meetings. And I'm told it's probably not an accident because they're not on it for two minutes. They're on it for half hour, 45 minutes. I mean, Mexico, places all India. Yeah, there's a list of about 20 countries. So uh, it's quite interesting. That'll be a good story for the paper to write uh, on, the, on the live streaming. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, two, yes. <laughs> no, uh, actually it's uh, pretty significant and that's good to see. Um, update on the issues, our website has been launched today. We've got improved navigation features and you can provide your feedback at letstalkniagarafalls.ca. The other thing to let council know, I know we've been talking about this for a long time, a paperless agenda. I know Councillor Cario, you've been talking quite a bit about it. it yeah, so we're moving forward. The goal is to have it by the fall. So uh, staff have already been moving forward on it. Uh, in 14 years, in 14 years. No, this this year. I know it's hard to believe in a town that we have Ripley's, but it's hard to believe, but apparently uh, it's coming. Is that right, Mr. CAO? Mr. Clerk, is that right? Okay, well, you heard it right here. Couple... Can we get an iPad You have iPads. <laughs> so on a sad note, obituaries, uh, Joanna Daniels, a uh, retiree from our financial uh, finance department, Brian Milner, father of Jonathan Milner of our Niagara Falls Historical Museum. Terry Lybrock, former Niagara Transit General Manager. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Shakaskoy, Shakaskoy, mother of Kent Shakaskoy of our Municipal Works Department. So our condolences go out to these members and their families as well on their losses. I'd like to thank council members for representing uh, the city, Councillor Strange, for representing the city at the grand opening of the new McDonald's on Highway 420 in Stanley. Uh, Councillor Campbell, what was that? Oh, I said he did a Big Mac. Oh, he did a Big that's right, he did. Councillor Campbell for representing the city at the Ontario Power Generation Winter Festival of Lights Sculpture Grand Reveal at the Heartland Forest. And to Councillor Morocco for representing the city at the Buddhist Temple, 20th anniversary and the grand opening of the Buddhist Chinese Art Museum. Uh, Pardon me? You were there too? At the Buddhist thing? Yes. Okay, well good. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. That's great. And Councillor Valpatti was there as well. I don't typically mention the, but since she's here, it's a good point, I should mention her. Councillor Valpatti. A couple of announcements here. The KO Childhood Cancer Event. Congratulations to Councillor Strange and his team for a very successful event. And I know we are joined by several councillors, including Councillors Campbell, Peter Angelo, Thompson, Morocco, and of course yourself, Strange. Did I miss anybody? Is everybody? Oh, and Councillor, oh yeah, okay, Councillor Cario, that's right, I forgot about that. <laughs> Did you drive there in your Ferrari? <laughs> no, okay. Okay. Also, a dedication ceremony 
uh, Jean Somerville Firefighter Museum uh, out in uh, Station 4 in Chippewa. I was joined by Councillors Thompson, Crater, and Morocco. Did I get everybody? Also, uh, Councillor Thompson made reference to the Global Legacy Boxing event, Fight for the Falls, uh, founded by Lennox Lewis. And uh, it was a fight for the falls featuring renowned boxer Phil LaGreco, who hails from Niagara Falls. The event was attended by Councillor Thompson, Campbell, Strange, and myself. Did I get everybody for that one? And uh, lastly, Canada Day. Uh, thank you to staff and volunteers for a great event, a sea of red and white. We had three Grand Marshals, Rich Little, Derek Sanderson, and Marcel Dion. And for anyone that stuck around, Rich Little did a little bit of stand-up uh, from the stage. Actually, it was very funny. He said that uh, he had a lot of ties to Niagara Falls, including, and also belts and shoes. <laughs> and he went on and on. He had a lot of, he was good. So the, the parade was attended by Councillors Morocco, Campbell, Peter Angelo, and Crater. And uh, it was a big crowd, big crowds, uh, a great day. And uh, luckily the weather held for us because it was threatening. And uh, yes, that's right, our uh, trustee, Helga Campbell from DSBN. And before that, we had a citizenship ceremony at the library as well. Uh, the Canada 150 Millennium Recreation Trail, we opened up another section of it, very, very exciting. Uh, congratulations to the city, and I know we are joined by uh, Councillor Campbell. You were there? Yes. Anybody else? Okay. And lastly, Chippewa Lions Park will be having their opening Thursday, August the 3rd at 4 p.m. That'll be the next opening of our 10 new park revitaliz revitalization taking place this year. So again, that's Thursday, August the 3rd, Chippewa Lions Park opening. And there will be a special council meeting Thursday, July the 20th at 4 p.m. It should be a very brief one to deal with the downtown BIA. And our next official council meeting will be Tuesday, August the 22nd. Uh, I do have a call for a motion. Uh, at the regional council meeting on June the 29th, regional council approved the triple majority and next steps to bringing forward intermunicipal transit. Our council in turn needs to appoint a member of council to serve along with myself on the IMT steering committee. And it's my feeling that since Councilor Morocco is already the city's representative at the transportation uh, advisory committee of the region, that it'd be appropriate that she fill the spot on intermunicipal transit steering committee so as well. Okay, moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Thompson, that Councilor Morocco join myself as the appointed Niagara Falls members of the Intermunicipal Transit Steering Committee. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Yes, Mr. Clerk? Uh, oh, I'll get right to you. There is an addition that's related to that matter that uh, on your additions agenda was uh, listed as number four under communications about the regional report for intermunicipal transit. Uh, a second part to that recommendation should also be to uh, refer to staff to select a municipal staff representative to that steering committee. Did you say four of the communications? Sorry, the, the, of the addition. Oh, additions. Okay. You can refer to it here if you like. Oh, I see, okay. Oh, right, okay. So um, would that suffice as the, as the motion or? Well, you've got the first half covered where we'll appoint Joyce Morocco as the council well, representative, staff but we're representative. also looking for a municipal staff representative. <coughs> so then, uh, do we need to make a motion uh, for that? It, it, I can include that in motion. Okay, friendly amendment, sure. include that as Carl as our staff member, you're good with that? Okay, <coughs> so we're good, thank you for that, Excellent. Mr. Clerk. Councillor Thompson, you had a, a point of business? I wanted to deal with the matter yes. regarding the law. Yes, that's right. So did you want? Uh, yeah, so did you want to make that motion, uh, 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 Councillor Thompson? Yeah, we did. We voted already, and we just had an amendment. We had an amendment. It's worse. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, I would like to make a motion that uh, uh, we assure that they can build on the three acres of lot uh, regardless of the circumstances and that the staff work with uh, knowing that the And the, the official address of that is, just so we have that included in the motion, I've got a second already. Do you have the official address of the- 8365 Bigger Road. 8365 Bigger Road. Okay, so we have a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange, 
that council will be on record of supporting the, the development and that you work with staff to bring that forward. Okay, of course there'll be official approvals and whatnot, but at least we're on record as being in favor. Okay, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? You're, you're in favor. No, I'm in favor. Okay. Okay, no problem. So we're all good. That was unanimous. So thanks for hanging around. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Much. Appreciate Thank it. you. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. He wouldn't have said that if we didn't vote in favor, would we? <laughs> no, really. It's impressive in here. Really. Thank you. I mean, if you already pulled the foot. Okay, got it. Okay, now we move on to the communications and comments of the clerk. <laughs> Item one. Livestock Niagara, they are requesting a waiver of fees related to road closure and exemption to the city's noise bylaw and a special occasion permit for July the 22nd. Did we do that one already? Okay, motion, we're looking for a motion to, yep, moved by Councillor uh, Morocco, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Niagara Falls History Museum request Relief of the noise bylaw for the Niagara Falls Night of Art, September the 21st. Moved by Councillor uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? It's approved, thank you. Number three, Niagara Art Showcase. They're holding a festival September 15th, 16th, and 17th at Fireman's Park. That's the one that we did already. And that one's already been done, thank you. Can I move the five budgets? Now there's one, number seven's been pulled. Main and Ferry uh, is going to be uh, uh, deferred. Don't forget to the uh, July 20th meeting. To, to the July 20th, okay. So we'll be doing the downtown BIA and the Main and Ferry BIA. Okay. So, um, Councillor uh, uh, Peter Angel, you're moving four, five, and six. So that's Lundy's Lane, Victoria Center. I'm sorry, and eight. So, so Lundy's Lane, BIA, Victoria Center, BIA, Clifton Hill, BIA, and the Falls View BIA for all of their 2017 budgets. Okay. Yeah, you made the motion, Councillor uh, Peter Angel. Yeah. So you got a who's got a, you've got a conflict, uh, Councillor uh, Cario. Okay, we'll do it in block then. Uh, Councillor uh, Campbell, um, any questions to that? I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. With noted conflict. <laughs> Niagara Tinting. Uh, Jody Burdett requesting an extension of revitalization grant agreement for 4480 Bridge Street. Hopefully everybody read that in the motion. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Niagara Region draft regional development charges update. That's just for the, uh, re just to be received. Yep, moved by Councillor um, Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? Okay, I know I, I'm trying to get everybody here. Okay, that's approved. Any additional uh, items for consideration, Mr. Clerk? Uh, yes, there was a, a list of uh, a few of them there for the additions to council. They were just uh, handed out today. Uh, number five, sorry, we should go back to number three. Uh, one and two have already been dealt with. Number three, the downtown BIA board, uh, they did at their last meeting uh, make a change to their board of management executive, and they were just asking for approval of council to those changes. No, no, this is just their um, their management. This is not the, their budget, not their budget. So I need a motion. You want to make that motion, Councillor? Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Campbell, that we uh, accept their um, their management appointees of uh, for their board, their executive appointees. Yeah. Sorry, thank you for that, not management. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Uh, number five on that uh, most recent additions to the communications was uh, for Heaters Heroes Run. Uh, they're looking for approval of council and there's a attached uh, resolution as well. Okay, we got a motion by uh, Councillor Crater, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. <laughs> it was denied, that's right, that one's denied. That's Thank you. Uh, number six, uh, the item was just from the City of Thorold. They're just following up with the OLG modernization framework that was passed uh, previously by this council, and it's just for council's information. Um, you may want to make a motion, I guess, to that effect. To receive? To receive. Uh, did you want to receive and file the letter of support from the City of Thorold supporting our uh, issue with OLG? Okay, a motion, I'm sorry, a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor... Strange, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Uh, next uh, request from Daniel Mes Masai. 
the request that August 7th, 2017 be proclaimed as Brother Sister Day. It's for the approval of council. Okay, uh, moved by Councillor uh, Cam uh, Peter Angel, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Approved unanimously, thank you. And lastly, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, they're requesting financial assistance in the amount of $400 to offset expenses that are incurred annually for the purchase of bus tickets from Niagara Transit. So an in and out, okay. Moved by Councilor Morocco, second by Councilor Crater. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously, Mr. Clerk. That's it. On to the bylaws. Mr. Clerk, are there any additional bylaws or amendments? Uh, there was one amendment. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a revision that's included in your package to update uh, bylaw 2017-85, uh, just changing a few more staff appointments to that bylaw. Okay. Motion to introduce the bylaws, right? Motion by, by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Cario, that the bylaws be given a first reading. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Bylaws 2017-82 to 2017-88, read a first time. Second and third is German. Motion. Motion. <laughs> By Councillor Peter Angelo to give the bylaw second and third reading. Second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? And that's approved. Bylaws 2017-82 through to 2017-88. Read a second, third time, and passed. New business? Yes, yes Councillor Crater and Strange. Uh, thank you, Thompson. Worship. Um, I have one item that I, I talked to you about over the weekend. Um, for the information of Council, this item is to uh, deal with the uh, reconstruction and repair of the existing uh, retaining wall in Shriners Creek. Um, there was submitted to council on two different occasions from Municipal Works a request to, to fund the reconstruction um, of the existing uh, uh, wall along Shriners Creek and both times it wasn't approved by council. So I want to just give you an explanation before I make the motion. Um, I visited this lady's home she lives on St. Michael Street, and behind her house and two other houses on either side, there's the Shriners Creek. Um, when the homes were built, there was no creek, and so the city, I think, uh, went in and created a creek, or they had to in order to allow for development. So that was fine, but what's happened is the creek is collapsing. And so her backyard is collapsing. When I was visiting her, she had bought the house a few years ago and actually spent about $70,000 um, renovating it. And she, this is her retirement home. I'm extremely happy to be in Niagara Falls. But her backyard is collapsing. And in fact, there's a beautiful tree. And if it continues on, even I thought, and I'm no expert, but yeah, I think that tree could fall over. So I did a little bit of research. And what I learned, thank, thanks to uh, talking to uh, Mr. Holman and to uh, Nick Golia, is that that creek that was put in by the city is our asset. Like we're responsible for it. So what the municipal works had asked simply for was that we repair it, and put it in, in the wall to make sure it doesn't sink and collapse anymore and deal with it. Because it was turned down twice by council, and I, you know, I don't think we quite realized all we saw was the line item, and I'm not saying it would be critical, but we saw a line item for Shriners Creek and we have so many things to deal with. And this was in the priority one category that it got turned down. Um, so I'm proposing that what we do is to approve the request that came from Municipal Works for the funding of this, which by the way is $165,000, $165, but we pre-approve it from the 2018 budget. We approve it now. And if we had done that before, we actually, we just did it tonight and earlier in our package, we did it for um, some development, uh, reconstruction of some sewers on one of our streets. We did, we used the same formula that I'm Harvard. proposing now. Is that Harvard? Harvard? Harvard, that's it, we did it at Harvard. So, uh, as I said, if, you're, if you talk to the lady, yeah, it looks, her backyard is slowly eroding and sinking into Shriners Creek. So I'm gonna make that a motion that we support the request from Municipal Works to fund this and that we do it in the manner that I suggest pre-approved out of it. And the reason it needs to be done, approved tonight, is because of, because it's an environmentally sensitive creek that there's only certain times under the Ministry, I think the Ministry of Environment or Natural Resources, that you can work on the creek. So 
therefore the staff need to know that this can be approved and then they can determine if they're able to get going on it this year or not, but they know they have the approval in place. So I make that a motion. Okay. So Thank we have you. a motion by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Morocco. Uh, Councilor Campbell? Yes, uh, would it be possible to get a comment from uh, Mr. Holman, please? Oh, thank you, thank you, Wayne. Okay, Mr. Holman? No, Mr. Mayor, uh, thanks. Uh, Councilor Craver, uh, uh, I think hit all the high spots. Uh, this is a section of the uh, city's retaining wall that's starting to fail, and uh, it's not going to collapse uh, right away. However, these things don't get better, uh, so it's going to make the project bigger and bigger if we don't get to this shortly. We've identified it as a priority one, but of course, uh, you know, among a, a number of other priority one projects, uh, and so unfortunately it's been set aside. But it will be something we do have to do, and the sooner the better. Okay, any other comments or questions? So let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor um, Strange, and then Thompson. Yes, Your Worship. Um, just after the last council meeting, I know a lot of uh, uh, council members have received a few emails um, regarding some comments at the last uh, council meeting, in particular um, one email from one of our uh, uh, popular uh, uh, priests in, uh, in Niagara Falls. Um, it was, and I didn't realize it until actually he emailed me and, I, and I, he put the times in and then I went through the actual the council meeting and there was actually two times where two comments went um, went on uh, with Karen, uh, Councillor Iannone, um, basically saying, and I know there was a heated uh, debate going on and, and uh, sometimes you don't think what you're saying sometimes, but she said something like, to get off my cross. Um, one particular pastor and, and popular priest um, saying being a member of the local clergy and not getting involved in politics at any level or taking any sides there was one comment made at the meeting that I found highly offensive, and I feel it must be addressed and dealt with accordingly. Being a pastor of a local Catholic church, I feel the need to bring the offensive co comment to your attention at uh, 3 hours, 42 minutes, and uh, 19 seconds into the video. When Councillor Carolyn Iannone spoke, she made hand gestures and said publicly, I'll get off my cross. How dare she compare herself to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the brutal death he underwent for our salvation. I'm unsure as to Iannone's religious affiliation, but this was absolutely ignorant, blasphemous, repulsive, and most detestable to us whose salvation was won on Good Friday in the cross of Christ. He bled and died on that cross for us. I trust this will be addressed in a, family fa in a timely fashion had Councillor Iannone used a sacred symbol of another world religion in such a flamboyant and derogatory manner, I'm sure there would be a public outcry. We've all around this horse, you have, have received a few emails regarding the same um, comments, and there's actually, when I went through, there was another comment at three hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds in which she did the exact same thing. Um, so. What we're asking, and I believe we would all like to see, because she, she did offend some, obviously, uh, Christian denomination in our Niagara region. So I would like to make a motion that Councilor Iannone apologize uh, to our local clergy and the Christian community. Councilor Iannone, did you want to address this? Yeah, we passed a code of conduct tonight to not to bully and harass, and you couldn't call me and ask me about that. Looks like we're not even following our code of conduct tonight. I will say through you to Councillor Strange, I emailed that priest back. Did you? I haven't, well, you have the copy because I sincerely apologized to him. And his response to me, which he asked me not to share publicly, was that he is very sorry that he copied all members of council. He was too angry at the time. He believes his God and mine forgives me and he appreciated my apology. But he did ask me, because the review called, because somebody around this council chambers gave the review that email, he asked me not to raise this issue in public, and I'm not going to. Well, that's fine. There's other emails as well, and you did not. But I don't have those. And, and you did not ask for, and you did not apologize. But I did. You, you have prayed for forgiveness, and am thankful our God is a forgiving God. 
he you prayed is, for forgiveness. And he forgave So you did not me. apologize to the Christian community in... The Christian in, community is not offended. I made it very clear okay, to the Okay, well, priest. I received emails, and well, other people forward them to emails. Me. Forward them to okay. me that are outside so of you, this So you are not going to apologize. I apologize to him if I offended him. So you're not going to apologize to the city of Niagara Falls? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this is bullying. That's Counselor, fine. I think what he asked you is, did you you made the comments publicly? Did you want to apologize? You publicly? have my my email to the, the to, priest. No, this is to then the send them to me. Counselor. And if there are more than that priest, I will apologize. So send what them he, to me. Counselor, can I finish my sentence? Mr. Mayor, you passed a code of conduct tonight that you're already breaching. So continue. I'm going to finish my sentence, you Counselor. That. You've been asked. If you would apologize to the public, you made your comment here in this chamber to the public, and if you choose not to, that's your business. So he's Thank asking. You. You. Councillor Strange is asking to make a motion. You need a motion for me to apologize. I sincerely did not mean to offend anybody. I made that perfectly clear. I'll make that perfectly clear now. My motion, my comments were made in the heat of anger. Didn't didn't mean to offend anybody, and that's not how I meant it. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you. And that Thank you so raised, much. Can I get that on record that she did apologize? Yes. It's on tape. It's on tape. Mike. Perfect. I Mike. just want everyone to know. Councillor Thompson. This is hilarious. Sorry, I had a couple more. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry about Strange. that. Thompson. Um, the other one, um, uh, we're talking about the boxing event, which we, which was an awesome event uh, that took place a couple weeks ago. And we had, uh, we, we just found out our, our grand, grand total uh, it was $64,000 that we raised. So wow. half of it goes to Ron McDonald's and the other half goes to Ron well, 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 And I want to thank all the counselors that came out. Councillor Ontario uh, for buying a table. So thank you very much. Very much. By two. So. Um, but it was amazing. And we've already booked a date for next year for, for June 15th. So hopefully um, uh, we can get a few, some stepping up the plate and, and walk the box. Um, Last one is our Heaters Heroes Run for Children is on August 12th. Um, we, and I just want to bring this up. Saturday? It's, it's on the Saturday. And we have currently have eight children. I don't have all their names, but I know uh, uh, most of them. And we, we give funds to kids who have uh, terminal illnesses or life-altering illnesses or, or injuries. We have uh, most of the kids have, have cancer, unfortunately. Um, there's one mu muscular dystrophy. We have one of our... Uh, a very own uh, Julianne Misk, who's going to be taking part. She's going through a, a pretty tough time right now. She's going through a second surgery to uh, fix fix her jaw, her, her jaw, and um, so she's really going through a tough time. But she's trying to recover, and she's actually going to be one of the, our final laps that is going to be running around the lap. Uh, and uh, for some of these kids, it's like running a marathon. So um, I would love for everyone to come. Uh, especially on our first lap, it's kind of our opening ceremonies, and most of the counselors come and uh, we do the honor of introducing some of the kids. So I just wanted to give an update on that. So thank you. Good. Thank you very much, counselor. That's great. I've got yes on that. Yeah. Oh, just to that point, I, I want to say that uh, the fight was a great job. But I also saw Mrs. Peter Angelo uh, fight, and I have to say, uh, if I was counselor Victor Peter Angelo, I'd be afraid. very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I want to say congratulations for your wife to step up and uh, go in the ring and fight because that was a pretty tough and daring thing to do. So uh, congratulations for your wife going in. And next time I hope to see you there. <laughs> Sorry. Councillor Thompson? Councillor Aino? Anyway, um, also talking about boxing, uh, we also had the uh, uh, professional boxing at the... Uh, uh, convention center, uh, our first shot, uh, and it was highly successful. S sell out crowd, and uh, they already have set November 25th for the next one. We're going to have three or four a year, and uh, this one's going to be bigger, more professional fighters. Uh, so uh, we have another event coming three or four times a year, which is which is going to be great. Anyway, I'm looking for some uh, feedback from the council. Um, uh, the mayor, uh, the CAO, and myself sit on the illumination board, which is made up of equal groups from Niagara Falls, New York, and Niagara Falls, Ontario. And uh, I was asked uh, to uh, 
sit on a special committee to look after uh, the management of the new illumination that was uh, put uh, uh, in this last year, a cost of $4 million, $2 million on each side of the border. Um, I hope I'm not starting World War III, but I know that the feeling of the Niagara Falls, New York people with respect to the falls and the illumination is to light the falls and do little more. We have uh, a problem where we have to vote uh, several times a month uh, where they want to uh, uh, recognize some particular major event and have the falls lit up in a different color or whatever. And most of the time, uh, it's difficult to get the people on the U.S. side because they want the falls left the way it is, lighted up, and there's little flexibility there. Um, we have the fireworks uh, that are going there, and uh, if you saw New York City uh, in the uh, uh, July 4th weekend, uh, I tell you, two and a half hours of unbelievable fireworks. So two our and a half hours? Hours was unbelievable. Oh yes, uh, it's just. And like Sydney, Australia, I don't know whether you've seen that, the fireworks there. But uh, anyway, our six minute fireworks is uh, rather insignificant to, to those things. And I think we have to do everything we can uh, to uh, put on a show every night. And that's my feeling, and that's my objective. And I know the feeling on the US side is totally opposite from that. I have people in the industry coming to me and saying, <coughs> we put in an extra $600,000 to have special technology uh, in the illumination of the falls to do some amazing things uh, to uh, almost uh, compensate for the fireworks, uh, music, uh, all kinds of uh, special treatment to make it a special event that people are going to come there, see the illumination, and it's going to be probably uh, one of our smartest marketing efforts uh, that we've done in years uh, to have the falls illuminated and utilize this technology uh, to the utmost uh, degree. Um, I, uh, uh, that's my feeling, and I'm going to that meeting, uh, those meetings, and I know the feeling on the U.S. side is going to be totally different. And I want feedback from the council. Is this not our objective to uh, uh, maximize the uh, illumination and the technology to bring people here? Uh, you know, you really have to be on the Canadian side of the border if you really want to appreciate everything. And uh, in the final analysis, uh, if we have problems, uh, is there, and this should be referred to uh, um, our solicitor to determine uh, if we have the legal authority to do that, uh, if there is resistance to what we want to do to maximize this effort, uh, could we just do the Horseshoe Falls alone and just light the uh, U.S. Falls the way it is? Uh, not what I would like to see happen, but it's a, an alternative. So all I'm asking here tonight is, uh, am I on the right track? Uh, or should we be falling in line with uh, the thinking on the south of the border uh, with respect to it? I think this is a great opportunity. We put the money into it, and uh, I uh, hopefully uh, can get the council support to go along with my way of thinking with respect to this matter. That's the So Councillor Thompson's asking, how do you feel we spent four million bucks upgrading the lights at the illumination tower 
on the falls. Uh, we covered two million on the Canadian side, and we're saying we did. Did we do it just to have LED lights that are brighter, or there's technologies that we can do so much more with lights? If you go to Ottawa now, they've got Mosaica, you know, in the Parliament buildings. They've got this. They're doing it all over the world. So there's so much technology that we can have. You know, we can have rainbows come in. We can have the things fade. Like there's so many. T but some people are real worried. Oh, I don't know. Don't mess with it. We said it's just light. And they could do light shows through the night. They could enhance. We have the technology right now. So Councilor Thompson wants to represent our desires because we put in a lot of money, as did the industry. And he wants to know, what do you want to see on the falls? Do you want to see the way it is now, just static lighting, change of colors? Or would you like to see the options and the features that they can do uh, with the new lights? So that's what he's asking for, is some feedback. So feedback, Councilor Morocco. No, I have no problem moving forward and supporting some new technology or new uh, opportunities to enhance. It's not a pollutant. It's not going to cause any environmental. I mean, the lights are on the falls anyway, and uh, I think that uh, that's forward thinking. I, I have no problem thinking that uh, we do that. I see the lights that are actually on uh, the oaks. Uh, that's that's amazing. You go by there sometimes, and, yeah. and I almost get an accident, so I have to watch carefully because it's it's, a, it's so impressive that. It does draw, and uh, they're doing it like Ottawa and everyone else. So yeah, I have no problem. I, if that's you looking for a motion, I would uh, support. Uh, you want to make a motion? You want to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we support uh, Councillor Thompson moving forward, doing some more creative yeah. ideas. So something life. that we'll let we're open to exploring yeah, and yeah, uh, open to exploring. Yeah, maximizing the what the lighting potential on the falls yeah. with the new technology. Will they come back to us with their report for if there's any additional costs? Uh, yeah, I don't think there. I think the, the infrastructure is in now. It's, it's mostly some software or upgrades. Yeah, it's not. It's it's there, and we already pay so much per year uh, for the illumination as it is anyway. So we've got I've got Councillor Campbell and then uh, Scario. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, you know, I I would second that, uh, along with what uh, Councillor Iannone was saying. Maybe uh, we can have a re report back after the summer. Uh, they may feel differently and want to be part of the process, uh, if that could be part of the motion. I'll, I'll keep you informed. Yeah. Yeah, and then what the- I, I was on the illumination board. It's, it's different over there. <laughs> well, the other thing too is we'll have a night where you can go view it. You gotta go after midnight, right, when they're done the regular light show, and then you, you can view the technologies. We saw one, they had the maid of the mist projected onto the mist, coming out of the mist, it was spectacular. They've got things they can do virtual fireworks, you know, with sound and light. It's they, the technology, lighting has come a million miles. We have virtual fireworks, yeah. This is some of the, but that's where it's going, but we need cooperation because it's 50% Canadian, 50% it's cooperation, right? If we don't but, do it, someone else well, will. What we're saying is let's at least look at it and see what, we're, what we have to choose from, right? Yeah. Councillor Cario. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> I think some of the partners that participated in the funding were told that this was what was going to happen. So maybe we could ask them for their comments because I think that they assumed that that was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. The industry play, paid a large part of the funding. Yes. And looking, and yeah, they're 300% brighter and they look great and dynamic, but there's so much more. And we thought the idea, like in, in Ottawa, at 9.30 at night, they do a show on Parliament. They get thousands of people show up every night for a free show. And that's the idea behind the fireworks because if people come for the 10 o'clock fireworks, good chance they're staying overnight. So they'll stick around for the fireworks, right? And that's one of the big things that people stick around for. Otherwise, you eat dinner, you leave. Here, they're like, ah, stick around for the, ah, let's just stay the extra night, right? So we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Morocco, that we uh, were supportive and that we ask, we want to see all the options that are available uh, to explore. Yeah, okay, let's get another one. Okay, moved by Councilor Iannone, second by Councilor Morocco, uh, that we uh, do what we just talked about. Did you have all that motion, Bill? You have to wordsmith it a bit? Okay, and so. If there's any additional costs, I'll come back to us. Yeah, if there's additional costs, in addition to the budget of the illumination yes. tower that, that they can't handle there, which I think they can. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. It's a unanimous resolution. Uh, Councillor Thompson, do you have any more? No. Okay, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the CAO, can you just give us an update of the status of whether we've hired a consultant to review the new fire station on Lundy's Lane? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, RFP is uh, completed. The RFP went out th this week, today. 
so the RFP is out and we have a staff committee that will be reviewing those RFPs when they are returned to us, which should be in a couple weeks time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other new business? Adjournment? Councilor Cario, second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? And we're adjourned. Thank you. See you on the 20th, special meeting.